the genesis of that movie. Did you ask how to? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I think really what that was was um, I had it years before. Not movie, but I had what I wanted to write about. Um, my ex-husband and I would often go out with this friend of ours, uh, a man, and he would have different women go out to dinner with us over many, many years. The three of us got older. The girls always stayed the same. <laughs> and I would sometimes just sit there at dinner and just look at him and think, so what's bad about me? Why would he not like me or somebody like me? You know, I personalized it, even though I was married. You know, but I would think, what's the deal that the girl has to be 29 years old all the time. We're all getting older. We're in our 40s. We're getting 50. We're in our early 50s. Kept going and these girls kept saying the same. So I was thinking about that. Every time I would see him I would think about it. I jotted down a little idea one time, you know, and just wrote it down. Do you remember what, what it take yeah. for that guy to like me? To discover me as a woman? So I thought, Desert Island. <laughs> We would have to be <laughs> stranded on a desert island, and that's right, just me. You have no other options. <laughs> so I created a desert island. I created a situation where this man was stranded in this woman's house. Right. So there was, she was it the was only that force game, proximity. She was the yeah. only game in town. Right. So we had to hang with her. Right. You know, you know, I mean, obviously, facts. I've thought about this a lot. At one point, I went on Match.com, and no one even wanted to go out with the age I was lying <laughs> and said I was. <laughs> That's when I went like, whoa, you know, what, what's the deal? Yeah. Well, so let's just say that then, then what you're saying is that the very... That the very beginnings, the very beginnings of this movie started with a question that was bothering you, that was gnawing at you. Can it, is it safe to say that? <coughs> An issue. I An issue, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But it was like... And he wasn't unique. He's not the only man that ever dated, or right. preferred to date young women. But, yeah. Did you ever say to him, like, what's the deal? I mean... I love I love that comment that Frances McDormand makes, and just about how women get more productive, and and I don't remember if she also said more interesting, but I really find that it does yeah, and I really find that to be genuinely true. I mean, one of the the um, secrets of being over fifty, at least for me, is how um, much more I enjoy life, and you know, take, sort of take things in stride, and yet you sort of get discarded. Um, Can I just say, this is on page 19. I turned right to it because I've looked at it a lot. Um, this is on page 19, and she, she kind of lays out the thesis of the movie, or one of the issues of the movie. Zoe says, the sister, says, no, come on, listen, here's the rub for women. And of course she can say this because this is what she teaches. I mean, this is her world. This is what she thinks about. I had to justify the speech, so. Well, it's brilliant. I made her a women's studies But teacher. she says, you know, look at what we have here with you and Erica. Harry, you've been around the block a few times, right? You're what, around 60, never been married, which we all know if you were a woman would be a curse. You'd be an old maid, a spinster, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so instead of pitying you, they write articles about you, celebrate you're never marrying, it makes you elusive and ungettable, you're a real catch. Then take my gorgeous sister here. Here. You know, and <laughs> she says, any chance of you stopping? No, no, come on, it's interesting. I mean, look at her. She's so accomplished. The most successful woman playwright since who? Lillian Hellman. She's over 50, divorced, and she sits in night after night after night because the available guys her age want, you know, forgive me, honey, for saying this, but they want girls who look like you. So it's like you, you found a way on, you know, it's not even page 20, I mean, it's barely page 20. You've laid out what the issue is so, so clearly, but what's beautiful beautiful about it to me is you also do the personal, which is a few lines later, you have Erica say to her, did you have to say night after night after <laughs> night? Couldn't you have said, you know, you do, you do the, you blend the, per night after night, would have been, <laughs> been enough. You blend the intellectual argument, so to speak, with the personal she, t you know, she, she's an intellectual woman, Erica, but she still takes it personally. She loves her life, but she still is like, well, nobody really wants to be exposed like that at dinner. I think as soon as they go in the kitchen, she yeah, says, she, have you lost your mind? Yeah, what she says, she? what are you possessed? How yeah, could you I mean, say those things? Yeah, I mean, but, but that's interesting that you say that because I feel like 
the whole movie is you exposing something about yourself. And did you ever feel... Well, that's not really me. No, no, no. Just, I'm not talking about oh, you. literally. Yeah. No, I'm not talking about literally, but oh. feelings. The feelings are very real. I'm not saying the... Yes, which is why it's a comedy. Right. Because if you're going to write all that about somebody that age, probably any woman, they're never going to make that movie. I'm blah, 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 blah. <laughs> right. You know, they're not even going to get to page 30, you know. Right, so, so it's not, unless it's, fu it's unless funny. it's deeply entertaining. Deeply entertaining right. and a big guy's part. Right, <laughs> right. But, but, you know, it's not like it's just, but it's, but nothing is just to do it. I mean, in other words, you, f you do f genuinely fall in love with Harry. And not just because it's Jack Nicholson. I mean, that helps, but he is, he's fascinating. He, he does, he is a self-made man. He is a person who can notice things about her that nobody else is really noticing. I know, that's so irritating. <laughs> That, that is the thing. So she says, and I only know these lines because I read it today <laughs> to prepare. But she said to him, I can't tell if you hate me or the, you're the only guy that really Ever gets got me. me. Yeah. Of course, he will never give her the answer, I get you. He will give you the answer, I don't hate you. Right. He will always leave it up, uh, not quite deliver. That's his character. But to me, that's Ever also really? male. I mean, to me, that's also a male thing, which it's is like, male, for sure. it's a certain kind of guy. Yeah. And it's dead on for that generation. And I mean, in my... It forces her to have to put two and two together, and then they're on to something else. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, it is mad. Right. It's all, you're right. I mean, I'm not trying to... I'm in no way disagreeing with you. This is all very personal stuff. It's all really truthful stuff. Um, I remember writing that speech, and I went back and added the blah, 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 because I thought, I'm stating the obvious. So if you're going to state the obvious, make it obvious. <laughs> so that I went back and put in, you know, if I say, you know, if you were a woman, I mean, oh, please, don't lecture us. So blah, 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 meaning everybody knows that. Well, also, you found, even though she's lecturing, because he's there, if he wasn't there and they were just having the conversation with the women, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be very interesting. But the fact that she's saying it in front of him and embarrassing her sister... And her niece. And her niece makes the scene... And him. He's <laughs> yeah. like, if you look at Jack during the scene, he, you know, yeah. he was starting to get the heart attack. It, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a totally emotionally, um, to me, it's a... a, a she's not a scientist a, in a way, you yeah. know, so she's finding it interesting exactly. that three of them are dying. But to me, that's what I'm trying to say, it's like a, it's like a human moment. In other words, it's not somebody just coming out of nowhere, dis ex machina, make, I need, there needs to be a lecture here, so I'm going to lecture. It's a person who clearly has feelings about this subject that... And she's saying, okay, there's an elephant in the room, let's just say it. Exactly. So you find, what I find really deft is that there's all kinds of times like this when people are saying things we, even expositionally, like that we need to know, but they're, what they are is they're put in, a, in such a way that emotionally somebody would do that. I mean, another example to me I was saying to Robin in, before when we were talking is I'm kind of blown away with the exposition in general because the way you help us understand that they're, they've seen each other a few times, but they definitely haven't had sex yet. Well, there's that to me. About the daughter and yeah. the daughter and Harry. I mean, that was obviously something, or maybe I should ask, that was something you knew had to be like that, right? Clearly, this Diane and Jack could not have had a relationship had he had sex with her daughter. There's just no way right. that could have happened. But so right. knowing that, I had to go backwards. I mean, I knew that. He could be, how could he be dating the daughter but never have had sex with her? So this weekend is about we're finally going to do it. Right. And he has a heart attack before he can do it. So you made that plot decision because you understood psychologically that the, I mean, I don't know if you're thinking that Diane's character, I mean, that the Erica character would never do that. Nobody you want to see a movie about would do no that. No one would but want to see that, exactly. At, at what point, I mean, I love the place where, the, where it started because I actually did ask somebody that question, um, the, the man who was with the younger woman, and I was just like, what's the deal, you know? Um, and, and basically what he said, you know, was he found someone who was maybe 38, 40, right? Still maybe 15, 20 years younger than him. But she was at his beck and call. So she was sort of 
smart enough that he could take her, you know, out in public. But <laughs> she, you know, if he wanted to go to Palm Springs or and but and it wasn't overly challenging. Um, but which um, you cover in that beach scene. Yeah, I finally do have her ask him, "What's the deal?" Yeah. Yeah. But then, what's the twist on that scene? And what makes it, I think, so memorable is that. She's just been asked out by Keanu, right. and he can throw it back at her. Right, because I didn't want her to be so judgmental that, you know, I think about these things. Is she just going to pick on this guy through the whole movie? Right. No, she's doing the same thing. This gorgeous young doctor who's 20 years younger than her has shown interest in her, and it doesn't feel so bad. So when you say, I'm like, trying yeah. to, you know, I'm always thinking about everybody's side of everything even though it seems to be a movie about her side I really take his side of everything very seriously how's he gonna feel in this situation when everybody's talk you know it was fun to direct him in that scene because of that you know um, well, I think that's but the in humanity general, in the movie that yeah. you're taking. The, I mean, you. It's it not is a punching bag. No, the character's not yeah. a punching bag. So. No, and there and there's and she and he. Yeah, I mean, there's there's just a respect given to him that I think. You know how they always say, um, oh, if you're if you're writing anything, they always, you know it's that that sort of bromide. But I guess it's true. It is true. It's totally true that like the antagonist has to be a worthy antagonist, or, in other words, the the enemy. The, the better the, the, better, the, the better. better them they are, the more the more fully developed they are, and the more mm -hmm. intelligent they are in everything. That's what elevates your hero or heroine, right. because if they're if they're fighting someone who's kind of lowly, in thought or just in who's sort of like a a loser in a way or just a baddie, but doesn't have much uh, human truth, it doesn't it doesn't make us interested it, it sort of reduces the hero and I think you're doing that in romantic comedy like you're giving him his his you're giving him his full humanity makes her more of a woman because somehow then if they could get together because it is I mean I was well, it's a romantic comedy I mean you have to want them to get together we were talking before um, when he said I think romantic comedies are the hardest thing to do and <laughs> Nancy said. No, I was wondering why you thought that. I, I don't, I generally write in that genre, and I, I, they take me a very long time. It's never, it, I think they, they look easy. It looks breezy, or it looks like it all fell together. Well, that's but the hardest thing to do of all, is to make something look like it is easy. It took, a, you know, close to a year to figure it out. <laughs> By figuring it out, is By that... writing it, yeah. The, and do you work, do you do an outline first, or what's your process? What's all this stuff? The, the first, you, your first idea had nothing to do with the plot. The plot eventually was... That's not true, it has every daughter... No, the, 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 I think. It's how do you tell that story? How do I want to choose to tell that story? That's what I want to write about. How, how do I choose to tell that, that right, story? Right, so when you're there with that question. You know, so I think it's all tied together. I just have to figure out how to do it. Right, so how? So what's the things that start in? In other words, what are the Who little... Who are the people? Okay. I always start with the people. Right. So is that what some of that outlining is? It's like it's just telling yourself or asking yourself, like, who is this woman? Let's find out. Yes. Nancy brought, Nancy, why don't you tell everybody what, what, what you all brought. that stuff yeah, yeah. is? I took out some of it, but not all of it. Well, I was asked to bring um, things. <laughs> <laughs> and she brought things. So I just, I went into my. It's your cupboard? Yeah. Thank you. So this is, um, oh, this isn't the right one. Oh, yeah. 70 some pages, 70. Two pages. It took me about four months. It's an outline. Um, I break it into acts, and I I just get my way through it. It takes a very long time. I don't um, have, I don't put huge expectations. Today I must this and this and this scene must be this many pages, and don't go beyond this because I just don't do that. I just let it go, which will bring us to what else is in my bag. <laughs> oh, is this the first draft? This is the first, uh, see the brads aren't even big enough. <laughs> so here's the first draft. <laughs> Looks like a phone book. <laughs> so what, how many pages were you saying that was? 250. 250. Nice. And this is what it ended up being. <laughs> so I lost half of it. 
So, so do you just allow yourself to... I wanted to kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> because I spent four months on the outline. I did, I did quite a lot of research, which is what this binder is. Uh, researching guys, like, I didn't really know guys like what Jack did for a living, you know? So I really researched that. Even though it doesn't surface that much in the movie, I needed to know it. I didn't know anybody who ever had a heart attack. So I, I went to some all-male heart attack survivor group therapy sessions. Wow. And sat in with them and, oh. and asked questions. Um, and I got an enormous amount from that. Is that where you got the inspiration to have him tear up and, and yeah. start? Because exactly. I thought right. that that was one of the most These guys told me how emotional they became. And also that they did things. I, well, I was trying to justify the movie. And so I would ask them, do you think it's believable after your heart attack that you would do something that you would never have done before, which is what Jack says to Keanu in the, in the, in the hospital scene. Mm -hmm. And they all said, every single one of them, yes, absolutely. We, you know, I went out and bought a Ferrari, or I did this, or I left my wife, or I, you know, they changed their lives. That's so touching. So um, that was super interesting. It is, though. Well, they were very open with me, and it was great. And there, you can't make these things up. You can't. You can sit in your room forever, but you're never going to get that truth of what somebody tells you their experience was like. And, and I, nothing was exactly what I needed, but I, I then felt okay writing it. Um, and I did lots of ER work, you know, like I had to write a scene in an ER and I didn't know how to do so. <laughs> well, that thing, did you get that thing from the, about the Viagra from, because um, that, that's so yes, hilarious. Yes, that came out from, came, came, <laughs> came out of the research that, um, well, you have to ask what they're taking, and you know. And I said, why? Why is that so important? What would be the bad thing? Well, Viagra for sure, because that would kill them. And there you're going. Thank you, thank yes. you, thank you. Yes, you just exactly. gave me an incredible ding, ding, pearl, ding. right? Yeah, so it's like really you're, good. you're kind. Is it kind of a little bit like a fishing expedition where you're kind of going, well, I, I just know instinctively or intuitively that I've got to do this research because I think something's going to turn up like that for me where I'm going to be able to. For sure. For sure. And I did a lot of research on men who never got married. That's unusual. Wait, how did you Still, do that research? Reading or uh, talking? Reading, yeah. Mm -hmm. Kind of just exploring, buying books, exploring famous, well-known men or men who were serial daters and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Do you think part of that is psychological? That, in other words, you just feel... Psychological for me. For yeah, you. I'm not ready to write. Yeah. I'm not ready. So, because I'm not ready, because I'm not prepared. Right. I haven't done all the work I need to do to begin, because I don't know the people well enough, and I don't want to fake it. So, Nancy, the heart attack, was the heart attack, were you just sort of sitting auction. around going, how can I create um, a desert island? A desert island. Is that what that came out of, or? Yeah, what, how can I justify that he gets stuck in her house? You know, it's not a Lucy episode. How am I going to figure it out? <laughs> he can't get his foot stuck in a, yes. like a vase. <laughs> you know, but you know what's so funny is, is I was saying this again also to Robin today, is, well, oh, look. <laughs> oh, yeah, you were, so you, you spoke to people. No, I just read about them. Geffen. I mean, just all... Different people. Different people. Covering from a heart attack. But also different people like Harry was is kind of like a famous bachelor. I mean, he's Correct. a little bit like known to be a bachelor. He's a bachelor about town. So you kind of went right. there. So this is amazing. This is all of her research. So let oh, me ask you a question. Hard. Why do you save the research once you've written the movie? Oh, I s I just do. I don't know. Because you might need it again. No. I just can't it throw stuff away. Mm. No, I, th I can throw everything away. I don't throw this stuff away, though. It matters to you. <laughs> yeah. And certain things are, are highlighted. Yeah, well, these are email conversations with a friend of mine who is an ER doctor. <coughs> so, anyway. So, so she, she has the conversation, and then she goes through and reads it and highlights it. Yeah, then I highlight the things that I think I could use, you know. And also, what do you actually get? Well, you know, doctor shows. You have to have those people around to help you. Yeah. So I had quite a few doctor scenes. So I had right. No, I mean you. The do I mean, I think it is not a accident. The doctor scenes, though, ab uh, you know, in in so many ways, they're about like the backdrop is it is that we're in a hospital, and the scenes are often about something else. Yeah. But they're so they totally never they, they they feel they feel completely true. I mean, there's it's never fakey fakey doctor. I mean, it feels completely well, true. Plus, you have all those 
you have doctors on the set showing you how to hold things and yeah. But I mean, there's all this level of every, there's always stuff in the scene. The scene operates on several levels. And even, even the doctor scene towards the end of the movie where he has the incident, the anxiety attack, I guess, and the young nurse is talking to him, or the, or the young RA, or, you know. Doctor, yeah. She's like, you know, if I were your daughter, and he's like, you know, he's crushed to hear that. You know, it's like you, you're, you're still focused on how would this particular character be right. in, you know, what right. can well, I, I mind? I picked a young female doctor because that's his specialty. <laughs> and she says to him, if you were my dad, I, and so he realized, oh, she sees me as her dad. I mean, it's just reality hitting him. It's reality. And those are the things that lead him eventually back to Diane. Right. That kind of, you know, in the glasses, that he's got her glasses and stuff. Oh my God! Because it's not I mean, just an object; it's a it's a symbol of they're both being the same age and not having perfect vision anymore. And they don't give them up. They well, wear everything them. about the glasses. But you have so many, you know, things like setting up Paris, and and she's always wanted to write something that ends in Paris. And then that wonderful moment where he goes to the theater and they're standing there, <laughs> and the Paris set comes in and the fake snow comes in. But you really see the that what they're feeling that they never say. Um, there's the poignancy of that. Um, but the glasses were another thing. And it, it's so emotional. Well, it's funny because th when they meet, you know, there's classic things, as we all know, in romantic comedy. And, and the, the, the cliche is meet cute, right? That there's got to... At that. Well, you have an amazing one. Tries where to arrest she, him. She tries to have him arrested and pulls a knife on him. Yeah. So it's like you could it's like to me that's that's classic that that's as classic as you can get I, I guess I mean we're, we're gonna go from there that's the farthest you could go that you're about to have a man arrested and you have pulled a knife on him to you're gonna get from there to I'm in love with him I mean that's the classic thing of setting up the the furthest obstacle right right and the audience in in this kind of movie knows people aren't going to like each other and then they're going to like each other. They come to the movie kind of expecting that. So the job is how do you get there without making the beats feel that the audience could write it with you while they're watching the movie. Right. Well, the freshness of, and I'm interested to know when this first occurred to you that it was her daughter, but the freshness of he's dating, I mean, that great line in the beginning, the opening joke, I mean, really the strongest joke, I guess, in the very first 10 pages is, you know, who would believe that it's worse, that, you know, you know it's worse news. It, it's not that I have someone breaking and entering into my home, it's that you're dating my daughter. Like, that's the bad news. And right. that's, that classic joke, that's ama that amazing joke, which is the premise of the movie, it's like, when did you get that, as opposed to just the question of, like, what would it take to have a guy like that notice me? When did you get to the daughter? Uh, I don't Is it in the outline? Did you find it in the outline, or? Hold on. All right. <laughs> well, I noticed when I was looking today, I seem to have a pre-outline. So oh. I seem to. I mean, this was six or seven years ago. I know. Um, you have to bear with us. Because I found this thing, all kinds of little notes. Notes. Thing. Nancy, what are the post-its in there? What are they marking? Stuff I want to go back to probably. Um, this was just, um, seemed to be various notes before it became an outline. Um, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's hard to manage everything, but. Uh, what was the question? I want to know. I don't know when the daughter, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. But I think early. But when you had that idea, did you start to go, oh but my sometimes God. I watch other movies. Like I, I'll watch another person's movie and I'll make notes. Like, like, what, like what movies yeah. did you watch? Well, um, I just noticed I watched Live for Life, the Claude Lelouch movie. I wonder why. I think I, I know that one. Know why I would watch that. I just like it. I don't know. But then I made some notes on it. Um, what well, you were getting in the mood. It's just like, if I may say, it's just like, yes. it's just like Erica where she says, like, I'm just playing French music because I just, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So you were like, because I think another thing we haven't talked about yet, because there's just so much, but I mean, the fact is you're writing about a writer. You're writing about a successful writer. And you, ca if I may say, I felt like you capture that something about being a successful woman writer that's... Mm -hmm. 
not often captured. I've never really, I'm not sure I've ever seen it. I did watch a lot of women writer scenes too, like Julia. Yeah, but she was great. Yeah, but a you did something that seemed so real. Because she writes a lot. Well, during all that crying and writing. Um, <laughs> that, that, see, that sequence or, or is so belly laugh out loud funny. You know, and the longer it goes on, the funnier it always is. Always a scene in every movie that's the most liked and disliked. It's one of the questions on the, on this. The focus. The preview cards. What's your favorite scene? What's your least favorite scene? There's always one scene that'll be the most in both, and that was the scene. That, that people was the most, most disliked, disliked and the mo most disliked and most liked. So you always keep it, in my opinion. Oh yeah, you got to keep that scene. Yeah. Um, did you keep the focus cards too? Yes, I have all of them. <laughs> so what's the, what's the experience like of going to to the focus? I mean, is that just something that you're interested in? Is it something? I mean, when you go there, are you it's dreading it or? Yeah, totally. Completely dreading it. Yeah, you've written a movie, you've made the movie, you've cut the movie. Now you actually show it to people um, who may or may not like this kind of movie, may or may not like these actors. Right, it's know. not like they say they sort of chose, oh, that's the kind of movie well, I they love. Do, that's not fair. They do recruit them and say it's a romantic comedy of Jack Nicholson, Diane Keaton, and. Um, but then again, there's some people that just show up and, you, you know, they take the tickets and go, what the hell, it's free. But I didn't let them have any. Um, guys together under 22 <laughs> and they didn't want to have any um, people over 55 I think and I remember saying you at least have to have people up to the age of the people in the movie <laughs> right right we don't have to go beyond that but at least up to this age so they they it was like the first time ever they recruited people that wow so elderly you, ha you had to you make a special <laughs> Nancy did you pitch this movie or was it I, did. I went and pitched it Oh, so at, at what but point I, in the I process? Question. You had some. Qu what was you asking? Well, it might not be. You know. Whatever. Yeah, I was. I was. Uh, you answered it. I. All right. Let me just ask another nosy question. How much of this did you have? How much? How many? How many outline-ish things did you have before you went and pitched? Oh, okay. Um, I only had it up to his heart attack when I pitched it. Right. So, did you know that the but, doctor of the heart attack was going to date her? I mean, I'm curious. Yeah, I believe I did. Right. I believe I had, and there's going to be a younger guy. <laughs> I think that's what I had. It was very cocky. I have not done that since, but I just come off of a pretty big hit movie, and um, the people that didn't make that movie were really sorry who had a chance to make that <laughs> right. movie. So I went back to them with this, and I had it up to... That's awesome. And right. he has a heart attack, and she's. I knew she was going to end up with him. I knew this was going to be a younger guy, and I pitched it as uh, Diane Keaton and Jack Nicholson. Diane, of course, I, I knew I made some movies with her, and Jack, I didn't know. So it wasn't like I was promising them, but, I, but that's who I see in that's the movie. That's who I see. But right. that was very clear at my end, because I didn't want them to later come back to me and say, you meant Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Hudson, didn't you? Right. <laughs> Right. And and at the point that you pitched it, did you have the um, the fact that Harry was dating her daughter? Yes, I did. Yeah. I had everything up to the heart attack. Because yeah. that's a real, you know, let's face it, I mean, everybody wants to have something that they can say in one line that grabs you and that you also feel you haven't seen yet. And that was that. That was that. I mean... He's dating a dog, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because honestly, even if that has been done, and I don't know that it ever had been, there was some. Mm -hmm. There's something about he hearing that. It, it's just it grabs you. You want to see. You want to see how that will play out. Yeah. And I think also because so many people could picture themselves potentially maybe having that happen to them, or it's not. It's 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 kind of out there, but it's also. Yeah, it's like. But it was like, how do I pitch it? A woman falls in love with her daughter's boyfriend, or a man falls in love with his girlfriend's mother. And you did the former, or which is it? I don't know. I think it depended on who I was talking to. <laughs> <laughs> to Jack, for sure, it was a man <laughs> right. I mean, <laughs> girlfriend's mother. Right. But, but it, it, I, you know, again, watching it, you know, at some point in the movie, Jack says, "Now I know what it feels like to be the girl," or something to that. He acknowledges that he's. The girl in the movie, and it was dumped for a younger, cuter yeah. version. Right. But what was it? Um, and he goes through so many 
indignities that character like one after the other well they kind of both do but especially well they don't uh, really let up they don't you don't really light up and it's so it. funny but you mean like well, well, he has a heart attack and his ass is out and it, thing. Yeah, and, and not just a heart attack, but he's gasping for air and he's on the ground and just able, everything about it. Yeah, and he, but then and he had to admit in front of her that he was on Viagra, and then you know to yeah. top it off, much later, he. It's such a fantasy. She's written a, a hit play that makes fun of him, where he is mocked and then and killed and then killed. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, it's so aspirational because it's like, I mean, there's so many ways in which truly it's just fantasy. I mean, it's just fantasy after fantasy after fantasy. The house in the Hamptons, the their be the beautiful way in which she lives. The not just that she's wealthy because that's that's actually just almost not the not the least. That's the least of it. It's that she lives in a beautiful way. She has her own success. She is her own woman. She know she's learning French because she wants to. She. She can make a beautiful dinner. She's, she, it's like, it's fantasy on a very elevated level. And then she gets to write something, she write him, she writes him out, right? I mean, he doesn't. She tries to write him out of her life. Yes. Yeah. I mean, but at the same time, he's so inspired her. You know, she's never been hotter. Right. Until he broke her heart. I love that little moment where Marin is just freaking out about her dad, and then out of nowhere she goes, you've never looked better, by the way. <laughs> it's like, this man has transformed her, and it's, that's intense. But she also tells her daughter that it's worth it to take the risk, even if you get your heart broken. Um, it Kids of divorce, you know, are wary. And she was trying to say, Don't, being afraid is not going to get you anywhere. Yes, it's so her daughter's, I think she says, so this is good, what happened? And she said, yeah, it was three amazing days, or four days, or whatever it was. But that's beautiful. But it's funny, I don't see the movie as being a, in any way a fantasy. You know, in part, I'm always influenced by the great movies of the 30s and 40s, where people lived in a little bit of a grander style and spoke, they were very clever and attractive and their friends were attractive and you know that whole world was just delicious I thought but I I, I think when for me and I and I and I've taken a lot of criticism for this kind of thing but I in a way it bothers me in a way I don't care because to me it's the emotional content is completely real yes and I've lived with this particular movie now for seven years and I've gotten so much feedback from it people telling me how they can relate to it and what it meant to them and how they experienced that and they got it blah blah blah, blah, blah. so how much of a fantasy is it? Well, I think there's a fa is it the two guys? No, no, no. It's I'm not, not that there's no. It's not, it's not that it's at the heart of fantasy because I think it's actually at the heart, completely real and justified emotionally, and that's what I just dress it up a little bit. Yes, you know but I mean, mean the the things that you it choose. It is a movie. Yes, yes, but I mean I. You know what I, I mean? It's yes, a documentary but, about me. Yeah, but if I may it's say, it's a movie. But very few people do that. Yeah, but I mean, I take it seriously. You know, you're gonna. Leave your house. You're gonna spend 20 bucks. You're gonna spend all that money on the food. You're gonna sit there. I'm not gonna do blah 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 blah. You know. So I'll give you some. Thank you for applauding. I just think the thi I just think the things you, know, so you choose are very delicately and perfectly chosen. I don't think. I mean, in other words, it's not just. Thank you. I don't it's have to argue. We're any, not arguing. No, no. I'm but actually I mean, arguing with other people. No, no. But it's. I mean, it's. 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 It's perfectly, well, it's what I was saying to you before in the green room. It's like the essence of romantic comedy, I guess, to me, is on some level you have to depict at some point what you think is sexy. I mean, you have to go out on a limb like that and depict what you think is sexy, and that's part of the risk of writing them, I think. And what you think is sexy, at least from what I'm getting from your movies, is really sexy to me. I guess that's what I meant by fantasy. In other words, I see a lot of movies and I'm seeing what people are showing as sexy or the sexy moment and I'm not finding it that sexy. And now I've said sexy enough times. <laughs> and we know that you and Nancy find the same thing sexy. <laughs> well, I'm not 
<laughs> saying Nancy and I <laughs> no, are just... that alike, but I mean, in in this way, I mean, I'm I'm just like all of her fans, but I'm saying I find that she chooses things that actually people would find you know, erotic. Like to me, you know, like when they're both in their pajamas and they're in the kitchen, and he says, "You don't want pancakes? You want pancakes?" To me, that was like a great date. Totally. You know, it's a sleepover without sex in the beginning, so that's good. And, you know, he's there all night, and the daughter comes in and kind of bursts the bubble. But if that's what you mean. Is that is what I mean, yeah. And the other thing I mean is when Keanu Reeves is reading her play, and he goes, <laughs> this is the best <laughs> thing you've ever written. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing sexier than that. I mean, <laughs> Keanu. Reeves, the cardiologist, is in the other room reading my play, and it's and the best thing I've ever written. Like that's that's a very good night, you know. That is. It was a big hit, though. It was the best thing she ever wrote because it was so honest. For it's her. so beautiful. Yeah, but I but I agree. It's like all this th movie won't be better with an uglier actor in it. Mm. No, it's not going to be a better movie, right? Uh, no. This is why oh, our actors, Yanu was an excellent choice. This is why our actors look the way they look and we look the way we look. <laughs> we pay to see them. Right, right. We pay to see yeah, us. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. No. So that's kind of the deal. But I love like all the, the when they walk on the beach and then it's raining and they're they're eating by candlelight. That is in a way what I know. It, to keep the movie interesting. <laughs> So the lights go out. That gives another thing to happen, you know. Things have to happen in movies. And when two people are in a house, there's not that much that can happen. You found a lot. Yeah. I mean, another incredible moment, because it's both hilarious and so true, there. is when... <laughs> no, but, I mean, when, she, when he... This blew me away. When he loses his way in her house, which could happen, let's face it. It's late. The guys had a lot going on medically, and he wanders around and he wanders into her. He sees her naked by accident. But what I love is that moment later with Keanu where he's talking about it and it comes out, and he says, I found, you know, I was looking for the kitchen and I wandered there by accident. And Keanu Reeves goes, There are no accidents. Freud says, There are no accidents. It's like right away we're tipping, Look, don't, like it's fascinating. Yeah, what was he doing? Was he looking for her? Yes, he was. was he was he looking for her? He tells himself he was looking for the kitchen. I mean, to me, that's such a human moment. Like we all know that that's true. You know, you tell yourself you were just looking for the kitchen, but you managed to make something happen. But it's still classic romantic comedy in that ooh, like he, they had now they've had a moment that is Well, he's a troublemaker this character, you know. Right. So he would make that happen, but I think he would never admit that he made it happen. What, uh, one of the things, you know, I'm, when you're talking about Jack Nicholson, um, to me it was one of his best performances yeah. because he didn't go, over he didn't top. go over the top. And, um, and so that, you know, that was interesting to me to watch it, especially to watch it again, and I'd love to hear how you work with him. Um, but the other thing was, as a comedy writer, there's so many moments where you could have added a joke. Where there really, I tried to add it wherever I could. No, no, but trust me. But but I wasn't holding back. But seriously, in those moments where they was really stripped down, and they were talking about how they were feeling like the moment outside the restaurant, that wasn't a place where you were looking to add a joke, well, was there? Comedy scene. Gotcha. But that's what I'm saying yeah, is you no, have no, these. No. Well, but the movie becomes another movie if every scene is somebody saying something funny which dilutes the moment at times you know so there was no I didn't want to no I want I didn't want that to to go in that direction but no that was no I see what you're saying now no it isn't I don't think that would have been good there no I agree but it but watching it also it gives a movie pace and tempo and it takes you in interesting places and it's unexpected and you're feeling this and then you're feeling this <laughs> rather than the same scene every right. scene every scene. You know what? That well, and it gives it depth too, and it makes it funnier when it's funny because you're so invested Her in it. Her heart's breaking. Her heart is breaking there. So uh, we had to play it that way. Can you talk a little bit about working with Jack Nicholson if you're comfortable sure. with that? Yeah, sure. Um, well, he's brilliant. You know, he's a brilliant person, first of all. He's. Um, 
he's fabulously respectful to the script. He memorizes it um, perfectly. He has a uh, in his trailer. He's got th the scenes up on cards in his trailer. He likes to know what came before, what came after, because you know we don't shoot it in that order. He sometimes has those cards with a rubber band in his pocket. He's shuffling through them and looking. He he's uh, he's a real storyteller, you know, and he knows like I know what comes before and what comes after and what did he do th five weeks ago, which is actually. 10 seconds ago in the movie, and he wants to keep all that. So that's how he keeps his performance straight. Um, he's challenging, but n never about, he's challenging just as a person, but not really about the work. Um, it's hard to explain, but it, you know. Um, is it similar to the character? Because the character is challenging. No, he's not challenging that way. Uh, no, I wouldn't say it's that way. Um, He's a very hard worker, uh, no doubt about it. And he, I can't tell you, I've never worked with an actor so respectful in terms of the words. He loved this script. He loved it and he would tell me all the time. It was like the nicest thing. I feel like really. it shows in the He really liked the words. He did not want to change them. Um, and in terms of size of performance, you know, I got it. I got all kinds of sizes. I do a lot of takes, and so I picked what I think works best in every How moment. How many takes is a lot of takes? Do you mind? Oh. Um, well, with Jack Less, he, 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 I don't think he loved, you know, under 10, but close to 10. <laughs> and that was in each setup? Or close? No. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He knew I was always going after things, you know, and and that's where maybe the challenge would come in from time to time, you know. But but that's our job. We have something in our head, and that's our job to go after it. Yeah, like to explain what you mean about that a little bit. Like, it's interesting. I'm doing I'm doing a project now, and you know, I'm I'm struggling a little bit. I mean, a challenge for me is always like to I do have I do have in my head what I want, you know, but at the same time, I have to I feel I have to try to let go and be open to what's going to happen. You know, and I know it sounds cliche perhaps, but I find that very difficult. It is difficult. No, you have to be, listen, you don't hire Jack Nicholson to be a puppeteer. <coughs> you know, I want what he does. I want him to bring his thing to it. He's now learned that script. He reads it every Sunday night at 9 o'clock before Monday. You know, I know he reads every Sunday at 9 o'clock. He really... He, he knows it the way I know it. And, and it would not be in the best interest of the film for me not to let him explore the scene, you know, and, and ways to do it. And like you said, in some movies, he gives really big performances, you know, and so he has that tendency where he can go there and he can also make it smaller sometimes than maybe I think it should be. Because so it's just, it's just sort of, you know, directing is just guiding it. It's just guiding it and just going after it and keep going after it. That's what I do. I, I also felt the same way about Diane Keaton. Was It was a very relaxed performance. And again, I'm not saying that she didn't put a lot of work into it. And I love those two actors. And I I mean, love them and I've seen them and everything. But you also, it, it was a relief in a certain way to not see certain mannerisms um, from either one of them. And it was also such a pleasure to see Diane Keaton, and people are going to laugh, but wearing something form-fitting that showed really how beautiful she was. Uh, she looked gorgeous. Yeah. And see her in white and... She puts it in the stage direction. I mean, literally, she's describing Erica, and it's... I loved your stage directions. They kind of blew me away. I'm incredibly specific in the writing. I really want to take the reader and the actors by the hand and lead them through the movie. I've, I've read, I don't read a lot of scripts, but I've read, I've read some scripts that are, th the page is too spare. Mr. So-and-so opens, well, who is, is he young, old, bald, fat, thin? Uh, tell me what he looks like. Describe it for me. The reader will imagine the wrong thing, and I guarantee you the director will do the wrong thing. So, can I just read this description? Uh, okay. This is on page eight. Erica, this is Erica's entrance into the movie. Erica is in her mid 50s and is a poster girl for growing old. It's actually hard to imagine 55 looking any better. And not because she looks 35, but because she makes 55 look graceful and right. 
Erica is the girl most likely who went beyond expectations but didn't realize until recently that being sure of herself was a handicap. She doesn't try to be intimidating, she just is. <laughs> So I, it's an incredible person. I mean, that's just pulls you into exactly why you're going to be interested to know what's going to happen to her. Well, you know, Diane Keaton is is a. Um, uh, I'm giving her guidance there. You right. know, I'm filling her in with what I'm thinking, and she can start to build off of that. And it and it clues everybody else in that's reading the script that's going to be in the scene with her. Do you do um, a lot of rehearsal before you shoot? No. It never works out. Why, nobody's, why is nobody's ever available at the same time, you know, and it's complicated. I had Alec was on 30 Rock and Steve was somewhere and then it just we can never get everybody in the room at the same time. Um, and on this movie, uh, it, I had a little bit more rehearsal time. Uh, I found with Jack the best rehearsal time was in the wardrobe fittings. Because when you put the clothes on, you know, he'd say, oh, I don't see, you know, then I'd say, no, well, I'll tell you why I think that's good because, but, and then we'd start to talk about the character, and that's rehearsal. You know, we can get to... So you're sort of start like doing it there. in a way that's organic yeah. and, and doesn't feel like a pasted-on moment. Yeah. And, we, had, we had one wardrobe fitting on, on Sunday's Gotta Give with him that lasted six hours, and he tried on one pair of pants. <laughs> <laughs> so we did a lot of talking. <laughs> I was just looking at these stage directions because a lot of them are amazing. Like, w w this script is is a copy of um, the of the script the will be in the library. In the library. So if you guys want to um, another, and this is the shooting script, um, so it's not the the 250 page script. Brutal. Um, this is Brutal. this just says there. You know, um, he's this is when she goes on her date. And we're close on Julian staring at Erica. He can't get enough of her. They're in a romantic seaside restaurant, and Erica's blushing for the first time in 25 years. <laughs> I just love that. I mean, it's just sort of a beautiful way of saying exactly where she's at. Thanks. Love that. Well, should, we, should we take some questions? Sure. Uh, right there. Uh, wait, though. Oh, wait. We, wanna we have to uh, get our microphone thing going on. Here we go. Sorry, guys, we caught you unawares. Okay. Uh, this lady right here. This we'll take a few questions before the break, and then we'll come back and, and get more and of take your questions. Lots of questions. You can talk more. Um, it's a really fun read. I got into town a couple of hours early, and I, I read the script. It is such a fun read, um, and you got great performances out of them. They gave you what you, um, you know, what you wrote. Um, I'm curious. Uh, Wikipedia says that um, you discovered Moss Hart at age 12, and and you have uh, uh, your first foray into showbiz was as a, an actress in the theater, which makes a lot of things that you do make sense. You. Have a, um, for me, your, your films have always felt very theatrical, um, especially what you do with the music. There's light motifs, and mm -hmm. and it's you know, and, and given that Win Winnie's right next to you, it just it's. I wonder if you consciously do that. If you pull, that. I mean, this is a very this particular one is is very overt about theater, but it seems as though most of your work has that theatrical feel to it. Do you do that purposely, or is it just? I was never aware that it had a theatrical feel. I mean, and you mean literally like theater? Yeah. I think you. I think you're saying that because uh, the movies take place on s the sim same set over and over, like a play. You know. It's like really a struggle for me. I have to write exterior night, like get them out of the house. You know, I really have to, because I could go forever from the bedroom to the hallway to the kitchen for like 80 pages. And I go, oh my God, I haven't put them outside, you know, ever. I think that's why you think that, because it, it, the, the house becomes a character. It feels like a set, you know, at a certain point. Um, but and that beach, man. That gorgeous beach. Beach, that was real. Well, I think there's also that. But still, the, the beach is also a set, I even think though it's a beach. There's also that element that in this movie, anyway, let's just say this movie, but I think it's true actually of others, but of yours, but let's just say with this movie, there's a small circle of characters. Yeah. And, they, yeah. and they have interesting interactions with each other. Like, you know, the scene where Jack Nicholson comes back and knocks on Marin's door. Not, you know, knocks on 
her da the daughter's door, and they have that little interaction when the daughter's now pregnant. This, I'm thinking of the scene where Jack Nicholson's that I'm in love with, where he has to go and get and get a checkup with Keanu Reeves, and they talk about Freud, and they talk about Erica, and then there's a, and then that scene plays back, and they, you know, the first scene where they talk about Erica, Jack Nicholson and Harry's complaining. He doesn't about, remember her name. He doesn't remember her name, but he <laughs> thinks she's awful. And then the next scene, he's oddly taken with her, and doesn't, and by then, Keanu is. Gen in a gentleman way, but he's he's kind of realizing something, you know. It's they're competing a little. Yeah, I like her. I like her too. It's like so interesting because yeah. they're they're with each other in two. It's it's two, it's two very similar scenes, but they're completely different in emotional temperature, and um, I think that's so what he needs Keanu. He's his sorry. Yeah, no, but that's yeah. what makes it seem it's like a well. Actor. It's a real checkup. Yes, You're allowed to go home. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's which is bad news. There's so many funny set piece. To me, it's filled with these incredibly fresh set pieces, like when Keanu comes to pick her up, and all of a sudden, weirdly, Jack is the dad who's like, bye, you know, have a nice time. It's like somehow people's identities keep shifting into things they didn't mean them to shift into. You know, then she comes home, and it's like, how was your date? And it, this guy who lives in her house now <laughs> is saying, like, how was your date with Keanu Reeves? And, they un and then they end up having a date. You know, to me, that that is exactly what Reese is saying. Like, there's an element of a play in which people are playing roles in a way. I don't know if I'm putting this right, but I do. I do see exactly what you're talking about, <laughs> because it's a small circle of people who interact with each other to a certain, building a certain level of tension and, you know, excitement. Also, the scenes are kind of long. You yeah. know, movie scenes tend to be very crisp and short, you know. Yeah. I was watching The Reader the other day, and, you know, she's in a thing. She looks over here, cut. Cut. You know, I don't... Yeah, that's tend, a lot of fun. I don't tend to do that. I tend to write <laughs> fuller scenes. Yeah. Very, very um, beautiful. There was a woman over there. Uh, yes, you. And then this gentleman next yeah. to her. Hi. Um, I was really curious about when you sort of are in your office writing and then you transition into, okay, I'm going to direct this now. How are you, when you're talking to departments and talking with actors, are you shooting for in your head how the movie was playing as you were writing it? I mean, does it, does the final product really always, sort of look always, like? Always, always, always. Really? Yeah, and then how I do never, you mask? Do you mask I don't that mask that. Really? Oh, God, no. Not even to the actors? I mean, meaning if you're if you're directing. No, Jack I think Nicholson. it brings value to the to the oh. movie that I wrote this movie, and this is how I saw it. And the set is exactly as I saw it. I, I draw little things, you know, when I'm writing. I oh. know it, I I draw plans and hand them to the production designer. I need the door over here, and I need this here, and the uh, stove has to be right here. There has to be a window above it. You know, I mean, I have it all. Wow. Yeah. And so, so that when you're talking to Jack not, Nicholson... I don't do good plans, but I mean, <laughs> draw them. <laughs> you know. So what, what is an example of, say, oh, not not him specifically, but just any actor, when, when you know, in, since you're the writer of it, without freaking people out, like saying, oh my God, she wants me to say it like it's going on in her head. What's an example of how you approach it again without, you know, acting it out, per se? Uh, well, sometimes I do act it out, depending on the person. Oh, okay. If I feel, not so much with Meryl, you know, but <laughs> with, uh, although she would on occasion say, just do it for me, just, do, you know, just do it. And then, you know. Um, it depends, it, directing, you don't direct the same with everybody, not even in the same scene. Mm -hmm. And the way I can say something to Diane could be different than the way I have to say it to Jack or to Francis McDormand or, mm -hmm. or anybody else in the movie. Um, it really depends. Uh, but, you know, I get pretty specific. Sometimes I'll say, just hit this word. I mean, I can be that specific. Or don't say it like a question. You know, <laughs> or just the honest things, you know, just... Well, you know, if somebody's making a joke, sometimes they know they're making a joke. Don't say it like you're not aware it's funny. Okay. You, you know, I mean, just whatever strikes me as being mm. not accurate about it, I will try to fix without 
being a jerk and without being insulting or making them feel they did it wrong because you know people tend to go there. So you designed the beach house? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> it was designed around the scene where they I am each other and they both come out of their doors I'm in a wide shot and he's on one side and she's on the other. So I actually wanted them equal doors, but we couldn't do that for other reasons. Wow. But it was designed around that shot. Wow. Okay, like actually, and the kitchen had to be down a hallway, like the bedroom was down a hallway, so that he could mistake it for the, he's not a total idiot. He didn't go upstairs <laughs> thinking that's the kitchen. It has to be on the same direction. Story. They have to, the house is totally designed by, by story. story. Oh yeah, the kitchen has to be exactly where the bedroom is, but just one hallway down. Dark, he missed it. Yeah. Okay. We're going to take one, one more question and then we'll break. I, I enjoyed the movie very much, but I was puzzled by the audience reaction to one scene. I don't know if you were here for the screening. No. You weren't. Well, <coughs> when Diane falls madly in love and then gets her heart broken, she figures this guy used me, he dumped me, and I'm, she's heartbroken. And she lays down the bed and she's crying hysterically. And the audience is laughing here. Yeah. They're laughing hysterically. Because of the cry. <laughs> You know, it's like this giant cry. So uh, I wondered if and that... She, the way I shot it, and she's got her arms up, yeah. and she's holding his glasses. She's pathetic. And, you know, and, and she's losing it. She's losing it, and it's a comedy. <laughs> there's a comedy cry, and there's a, you know, not comedy cry. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Since it's okay, any reaction's fine, but I, I like the laugh. <laughs> but I, it's fine if you're not laughing, because it's sad. S since I once had a broken heart, I didn't think it was funny. I, I felt it was very sad. <laughs> Aww. Let's all hug him okay, at the break. I think, I think that's a perfect place to break. Well, let me just say one oh, thing. Oh, 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 wait. Let me just wait. say one thing. It's my own broken heart that propelled the entire writing of the movie. I was that person in tears writing for month after month after month after month, laughing and crying and laughing and crying, just like I had her do what I was doing in an exaggerated form. So uh, I'm right there with you. But you know, in a movie, you, 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 you know, I'm making a comedy and the audience has to be with you and I thought it was great when they all laughed there. But we've all had our heart broken and we've all been in a state where people would feel for us and where, if we're looking back at it, we would laugh at ourselves. Here's how they wouldn't have laughed. If I was close on her face, right, if I did like a close up, dark, because there wasn't a lot of light on in the room, and she was like, <laughs> you know, just some kind of more, but it was, we just exaggerated it, you know, and her body language was hilarious. I, and I think, if I may, that there's an element, too, where, you know, I think I know I've been in a situation where I'm relieved to be crying. I'm relieved to be crying and on some psychological level I'm enjoying it because I'm feeling something so much and that character is was was somebody and she says it in many different ways. She says it to her daughter, she says it to Jack Nicholson. She's somebody who was locked away on some level and she's now feeling everything. Locked away in a turtleneck. And it, it, truthfully, let's face it, she even says this is this is your your heart attack's the best thing that ever happened to me. I mean, she th th part of her that's one of the reasons that this is an elevated movie and not just a a cute movie, even though there's so many adorable, lovable moments in it, because on some level, how hilarious that sequence is, there is a psychological truth that makes it funny, which is that she is enjoying her own pain. And, and that I swear well, to you, it, that is part is of it. It's propelling her script. Yes. So, she's and she, so she knows that. Yeah, so she, she can keep it going. Right. You know, for her own. Yeah, she's not just enjoying it. She's using it she's, to, she's using to it. move her life forward. But, you know, th there's one shot I did where she opens her eyes and cries. She just wakes up and the tears <laughs> come out of her, you know. Well, that's like the funniest part. I that's mean, pretty <laughs> funny. But that's really how bad it was for her, you know. Even in the shower, she's crying. I mean, she, yeah. there's no location where this woman is not. That tears. was brilliant. The longer it's it goes on, the more the laughs kind of start. Look, he looks sad, but I'm... <laughs> he still looks sad. Okay, I think we need to break. I think we we'll need to break. And when ourselves. we come back, we'll take more of your questions. Okay, so let's take, um, would you want to just say that one thing to me that you said at the break, just, uh, that you said at the, at the table read before we take the first question of the, 
of the second part? I don't have to push anything. No, I think okay. you just hold it close. Um, what I was saying um, to Winnie was that um, at the table reading of uh, the first table read of the of the script of something's got to give, I I wrote a little speech, which I gave, and the only thing I remember that I said in it was that both of these characters believe um, at the beginning of the movie that they know exactly where their life is going and who they are, and that they could predict. Both of them would have been able to have predicted the rest of their lives, <coughs> and. Um, that's what we were here to find out that that was not true, and how do they cope with that and deal with that? You know, she's sort of ready to embrace it. He runs away from it, and um, how do they end up where they are? You know, it's at that age, it's hard to make a change. You know, and for her, it undoes what she was. She, you know, she says at one point in the movie, you know, what am I going to do with all this? Now that he opened all that up, you know, she was stuck with that. No. So. That's, that's um, again, I relate to that character so much, but I was saying to Winnie, I'm so happy with my life. I really genuinely enjoy my life. The only time I really ever feel lonely is if someone comes into my field who I am attracted to and then it craps out. That's when I feel lonely. But the rest of the time, it's like uh, my life was going perfectly great and I really like my life and now this has sort of ups upset it. So I really, really related to that. It's very sad. It's almost as sad as that guy. Um, <laughs> right there. I won't be sad. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm I'm part of the fan club. I'm like Winnie. I'm like, yeah. Um, and and I, I too was going to follow up with the set designs because I've always said like your houses I want to like live in. I'm like I just want to move into the Nancy Myers house. It's each house in each movie is so distinct and like you said a character. But um, my my question was when you're when you're putting on both hats as writer and director and you're so close to a project when you kind of get to the end and you and you you shot it how you want it to go and you get to the end you're in the editing process how hard is it to like let go of stuff like i mean when you're trying to get the pacing and flow right like how you like let go of, like I have those, no those darlings no. i will i'm the first to cut stuff i have no problems i don't want to cut things that make the movie make sense or make the character make sense but just because like there's a scene in something's got to give that's on the dvd of um where jack um after the hospital scene with keanu he can he he's allowed to leave and he tells her he can't leave till the next day and that night he takes her out and he, they go to a karaoke bar and he sings to her it's it's on the DVD if you want to see it, and um, it was a really big deal to get Jack to sing, and he, you know, he re pre-recorded. It was like a, I mean, I mean, it was like a deal not to get him to sing, but like you know, yeah, it was a deal in terms of going to a studio and recording the song. I mean, it, for us making the movie, it was a thing, you know. And it was a nightclub scene, and so there was a lot of people and a lot of extras, and so. He, and he was terrific. And he sang La Vie en Rose to her as kind of a thank you to her <laughs> for putting up with him. And she was brilliant in the audience. I mean, she was so in love with this guy. And then the next day he leaves and she gives him the stones and something to remember me by and all that stuff. And then, you know, it just felt like I got, I felt I understood. I knew how much she liked him. I knew he liked her. I didn't think I needed it. And, you know, there were people saying, no, leave it. And I said, no, we got to take it out. It's just going to go faster here. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got a lot of movie left to go. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty good about that. What if, can I just ask, what about what the, when we're at the stage of the 250-page script? In other words, is it... What, what's your what's your editing process then? In other words, what well, I save what I like. This is important. Circle it. That's got to get in. Other things are like blah, blah. Like I had him in a group therapy session with other men who had had heart attacks, um, and they all shared the stories. And he talked about Erica, and it came out, and you know, and that just all went. And uh, you know, there's just some block big scenes that went out, but. Did you sort of say to yourself, well, I'm doing that with the character of Julian. I mean, he's sort of, he, he's yeah. talking about her with, Do it with him. him with and that ties it in neater, you know. Right, because it's like it's, we're not going outside the right. circle. I had scenes with Jack and um, John Favreau. Right. They had scenes together. I, I shot a scene, actually, with them. The, the two scenes that I remember cutting were the 
karaoke scene and a scene with Favreau where he can't sleep when he's by himself and he goes down to Favreau's room and says, can I, can I, you know, come in your room? Oh, that's adorable. And they watch uh, Lucy together and he, and he says, I never realized funny women are so attractive, you know, and he was like really talking about her. Right. Again, you don't, didn't need it. That's, I just have to, I'm not going to monopolize, I swear, but I just have to mention an, a great touch, which as a writer I just admired. When John Fat, when he's in the hospital, when he's had the heart attack, and John Favreau, the assistant, comes, and anyway, it's in the script. I forget now if it's left in the movie, but I think you see John Favreau crying and hugging him. There's something about that touch that you let us understand that. This is a person who ad is adored. Right. Well, when you have a movie where Diane's daughter's in it, Diane's ex-husband is in it, Diane's um, um, sister's in it, who does Jack have? Who, he can't be a person who's lived all these years without anybody. Right. And the ex her ex-husband, too, is there. Exactly. She's, right. she's, she's got a network of people that help her character, help explain her character. Right. So I needed him. So that's the thinking. It's like it can't be so unweighted on right. her side. Right. Right. I just wanted to illuminate that. Okay, let's take more questions. Uh, oh, no, we need the mic. We need the mic. It's coming. It's We're going to make you work for it, Pamela. I know. Who is it? Who is it? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi. I have two, two questions, if I may. Um, one, how was your experience being a female writer writing romantic comedies with female uh, protagonists in the studio system, especially in the early days? Did you have, cha I mean, I'm sure you did have challenges. How did you deal with them? How did you um, maneuver all of that system? And the second uh, question. Well, let, why don't you let her answer the first one, because that's a great question. And then we'll get to the other one. In the beginning, <laughs> <laughs> the early days, as you put it, um, it, w it was hard. Uh, as I recall, um, I think it might have been, maybe it wasn't in my contract, but they wanted to put in my contract that I couldn't be on the set by myself. In other words, my, my ex-husband, my partner, had to be there. Because he had had a little bit more experience than me, but I don't think it was just that. They, they put that in your contract. Wanted to. She can't make sure Charles are always there. She can't be there by herself. I mean, I was 29, and I wasn't that dumb. I think I could have handled it. Um, so, how did you react when you heard about that? <laughs> if you react to all of this stuff, you know, you, can't, you just got to go forward. I'm just a person that moves forward. You know, I didn't like it. You know, I didn't like it. There were pictures on the set in everybody's prop box of naked women and stuff like that, you know, and I would one by one get rid of them all. By the end of the movie, they were all gone. It was a different time. It was really different. Um, oh, pardon? It is different. They still put their pictures up. No, I don't know. Well, I don't see... I don't see them anymore on my set. <laughs> um, but it's been interesting because I went from the youngest and only woman to now one of the oldest people of many women. Wow. So well, that says a lot. It's very different. It's really different. That, that is cool. pretty cool. I think you should be applauding oldest woman. <laughs> yeah, on a side note, how do you feel about uh, the first woman director winning the Oscar? Love it, love it, love it. Thrilled for her. Fantastic. Um, and another quick question, if I may. Um, how do you uh, approach, or how do you do it, or what's your, I don't know, uh, to you, oh, I guess how do you do it, uh, going from uh, doing all your rewrite process from when you finish the first draft, draft until you give it to the studio to um, green light or whatever it right. was? Uh, I do a lot of drafts. I keep going through it. You know, um, my process for writing it, probably similar to a lot of yours, is um, in the mornings I read what I did yesterday. This is when I'm laying a draft down. So I pretty much up to lunch, I rewrite yesterday's work. Then I eat something, and then I do new work. Mm. You know, and then the next morning I read that. I don't, f I, I can put it away. You know, I like to know that, okay, I know I have to fix that, I'll do it in the morning. I kind of like knowing that I have work to do when I get there in the morning. Um, and then I do many, many, many drafts. You know, I just, the, the reading of it is painful. I mean, it's, it's a friend of mine, um, says, you know, they pay me to write it, not read it. <laughs> he hates reading it. <laughs> Do you have um, anybody that you give it to at any point? Sometimes, yes. Um, 
Sometimes I do. Sometimes I'm nervous, too, because I, I'm not ready for feedback. Once I'm feeling confident about it, I'll give it to a couple of people. And, and it's helpful because, you know, if you hear the same thing a couple of times, you know, it's probably true. Or, and I, I, you know, what was their part you didn't like? Is it, did you find that funny? Did it ever get slow up? Is there anything you didn't get? It's pretty much I ask what the preview cards say. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, you do want the feedback. Um, but I do many drafts until I show it to somebody. So you don't get, you, you, you're not going to put yourself in that position. No, and I will not hand it in to the studio knowing it needs work. That, I think, is a big mistake, which I hear young writers do. They think, well, they're going to give me notes anyway, but forget it. Write that thing till you have nothing else to add before you hand it in. There, there are so many movies that they read, and they make so few. They make 15 movies a year out of 10,000, hundreds and hundreds in development. Do not, do not hand it in knowing it needs work. Do you think even That's if someone is... Shot. Yeah, what if someone is like sort of pressuring you or saying we've got to see it or something like this? I mean, um, I think honesty is the best policy. You know what? It needs a little, I, mean, I, I need another three weeks. Whatever. Kill yourself. Stay up all night every night for three, whatever. Don't take four months, but keep working on it. You know, I, I, you know what I would say? What I have said is I just got a great idea, whether that's true or not. <laughs> No, rather than, oh, you know that's what, really good advice. I have a really sucky third act that needs work. I'll say, I just came up with something so great. I have to make this work. you got to give me another. Whatever. That is a great line. <laughs> totally. I am so super using that. <laughs> I'm um, glad I could help you. Let's take one. Uh, this. Oh, do you have the microphone? Then let's go with you with the microphone. <laughs> I was wondering, when you were growing up, how did you know that film was what you wanted to pursue? Is there, I didn't was there a know moment that or when I was growing up? Is there a process? I liked show business, and I don't know how I did. I grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia with not a single soul in show business, unlike my children, who grew up with all kinds of things happening in our house. I don't know how I was just attracted to it. And you're right, I, I read this book when I was really young called Act One, all about the theater. And I thought, this is the greatest life imaginable. This that is a great book for any of you who haven't read it. It's really worth it. I mean, it was life altering it. for me. And then I got involved in local theater as a kid. And, you know, they weren't exactly looking at me to direct or act. I was 12, you know, so I was <laughs> a kid, you know, in the, in the back row and whatever. I saw that book in, in the movie. On it is on her desk. How many people in this room have read Act One? It, it, it really is a, an incredible You guys are book. so lucky who haven't read yeah, it yet. I, I'm uh, envious of it's you. It's the best showbiz book It ever. is the best showbiz book ever. Um, more questions? Uh, I actually put my copy on her desk. Oh, wow. So is that like a thing that you'll do? Um, it, it seems like it. It seems like, well, the, 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 the I bring stuff from my house sometimes and put it around, and sometimes I take things from the set and put them in my house <laughs> at the end. <laughs> it's both ways. Well, who can blame you? Did the rocks, I mean, did the rocks come from something you do, um, the little stones? Yes, I collect only white rocks, and my daughter said to me one day, why do you only pick up the white ones? <laughs> I said, I don't only pick up the white ones, and I looked around, I said. <laughs> it's such a great revelatory touch. All right. So uh, where's, the, where's the mic? Okay. Yeah, oh, go. Cool. Go. Um, what is your process in the editing room, and what is your relationship with the editor, which is the final writing process? It is. Um, the last three movies uh, I did, um, Something's Gotta Give the Holiday, and it's complicated with Joe Hutching, who's a fabulous film editor that I love, and I love being locked in a room with him all day. I really do. I'm just crazy about him. He's fa he's just a fabulous editor. He's fabulous to spend time with, and he's a great collaborator, and he lets me be me, you know, and if I want to see every inch of this, everything I shot, and it takes us two days to look at all the footage, he never says, do we really have to watch all the takes of every, you know, he's just cool. And, um, I look at everything. I really do. I, I, I look at every take, which is when I'm doing a lot of takes and the actors are rolling their eyes at me, I say, you know, I look at all this stuff. This is all the pieces that we need. Don't worry. Blah, blah, blah. I really do. I look at everything, um, which is not always true of everybody. They don't always look at everything, but I'm always looking for some. And I make an insane amount of notes every night. I email him after shooting. 
which is a process he and I have come to that really works because he's in LA and I shot, um, well, this last movie I shot in Brooklyn, it's complicated. He was in LA and he's not around, he doesn't see dailies with me and this was true even on Something's Gotta Give which I shot mostly in Culver City. He just doesn't come to dailies and we don't talk that much during the day. So I often think what's it like for him to just receive all this footage and you know, I try different, how does he know I hated that, even though I'm, see, he hears me going, that's great, that's great, you know, how does he know I really thought, oh, don't go there, <laughs> you know. So, um, I send him notes every night. I tried this, I didn't think it worked, but there was something good, in, and I'll remember the take number, just look for that thing, see if you agree. And it's always great to hear what he thinks, because he's not there in the moment. He's separate from it, like the audience is, so. If he says, it didn't really work for me, you know, that's a great thing for me to hear. But mostly he's very enthusiastic. He's a great audience. This, do you mind me? How about, okay, this lady had her hand up for a while. Oh. And Hi. We'll go, and then we'll go over to this side. Um, first of all, I just I just want to say um, I'm I'm such a fan, and thank you so much. As a smart, intelligent, together woman, it's so it's such a, a pleasure to have well-written female characters of all ages, and um, it's seriously you just, you've just elevated the genre. So thank you. Thank you um, for saying that. <laughs> well, you know, I mean. I'm a movie goer. I can't, I mean, I've stopped going to some movies. I mean, I don't go to the movies as much as I used to. You know, it's just, you know, you do want to see something that you think is true reflected on the big screen. Well, it's on television. I wrote this down. I wrote, analogy to gay or black people feeling not seeing themselves on screen. I mean, I feel like there's an analogy there for a certain kind of woman. And I don't just mean a successful quote unquote woman, but a certain kind of deep thinking woman, if I can say that without cringing. I mean, it's hard, it's hard to never see that on screen. Uh, it's, it's hard to never see that. And I think if you're gay, if you're African American, if you're a woman, 40. if you're over yeah. 40, to, to just not see yourself depicted, there's a lack there. You may not even know there's a lack, but then, uh, then when you do see it, there's, a, there's such a sense of, there's such a sense of validation. So I do think that that's where a lot of the emotion comes from us as the audience. You know, I went back recently and I watched two movies that one seemed a little dated, the other really uh, held up. One was A Touch of Class. Glenda Jackson, you know, you could, you could, how about going in saying, oh, we want to make a movie with this Glenda Jack, you know, this, somebody who was even remotely like Glenda Jackson and um, an unmarried woman. Yeah. And these were two great movies, and I was young that movie. when I saw those movies. I mean, I wasn't watched them both before I wrote. Oh, it's really? Oh, well, both those so movies, cool. Those two movies. That's I so love cool. I love that movie, and that movie really <laughs> holds up. That movie is so. You know current. that scene at the beginning where it's a really long scene while Jill Clayburgh is just dancing around the apartment in her underwear. I mean, it, it's amazing. But I just remember, and I was young. It wasn't like I had to only see movies about. Kate Hudson losing a guy in 10 days. Uh, you know, I was able to watch people who were a little older than me and still be interested, and I miss that, um, the, the sophistication of it. Yeah. You know, somebody who's got a brain in their head who, you know, who I really relate to. And the so. women were written well. Oh yeah, they were, they were human beings. Yeah. What, go figure. Yeah. Yeah, what a oh, shocker. Could I, could I ask my, I did have a oh, question. I'm sorry. That's okay. Oh, no, sorry. I, wanted to, I definitely wanted to say that. And then, um, <laughs> I just needed to That was your introductory remark. Okay. Yeah, no. Sorry, sorry. I, I just, it was, um, it's about the writing and the casting process. Um, it seems to me that your casting is so pitch perfect. And I'm curious as, as a writer, if you, um, because oftentimes I think the characters that you create in your, in your head, are so different from an actor, you know, from, from somebody else playing them. Almost everybody's and wrong that comes in. <laughs> so I, I was wondering, like, if you, do you write with somebody in Otherwise mind? Otherwise you'd cast zero movie in a week instead of five right. months, you know, or four months. It's because you end up, you get these amazing people, obviously, and, and I wonder if, do you, do you have them in mind initially, or do you create the um, characters? The lead actors I do have in mind. 
mm -hmm. um, a lot from the, from the beginning. I wanted Jack and Diane very badly. I had no idea who was going to play the daughter or the sister or the ex-husband. But that didn't have a big cast, that movie. Um, but I do, I do think about it. it. It helps me when I'm writing. I know some writers think it would not help them to be thinking who could play this part, but I'm not writing a novel. Someone is going to play this. And it gets it away from me. You know, hearing my own voice. If I can picture Jack Nicholson saying the lines, it's better than me saying them. Me, him, slash, whatever. You know, it just helps. It makes it real for you. Yeah, it, it, it's not me, which is the most important part. I, it's, I can attach it to somebody. I can picture, you know, somebody else saying it. But then you have to go get them. Or then you, you know, you didn't but, get But even person. if you don't get them, the part is going to be good enough to get no, some I've other done, guy. I've done it where I don't get them, and you would never know, and you'd think that's the perfect person for right. it. Right, right. But it helps make it more specific. And I like, too, it's like you, the, the characters, you, you have to relate to them, but they, they can't all be you. You have to find some way to... Right. Well, they're not you. I'm writing this man in his 60s having a heart attack who's a woman. I, I mean, he's nothing like me, but I have to write every word he says. So in some way, he's going to... There'll be something about m me. It's hard to describe. You know, you're writers. <laughs> you're everybody. <so. laughs> yeah, you're everybody. And but it, like you're saying, it's a tool. It's a tool to picture. It's a trick. Um, yeah. It's a trick that I use. Right. Let Let's go to this side of the room. Um, does somebody oh. have a microphone there? Yeah. Oh yeah. So we'll have this lady on the aisle. Is that where her, where we're gonna go? Yeah. Sure. Why not? This lady on the aisle, and then and then you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, since you were so nice enough to bring in all of these materials you have in front of you, yeah. can you <laughs> kind of go over what your, your process is? Did you say you had a 72-page outline? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what was your, if, using this movie for an example, what yeah. was your timeline in that with your research and, and how did... I remember that it took four months to do the outline and then another six months till I was done. Is that what you mean? Yeah, just... Yeah, the research was probably a month, mm -hmm. you know. And then your, you, your finished script, you said, was 250? It's right Isn't there. It? No, 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 so you... But you weren't... Um, I think so many of us Six are, months till I got to the script that I handed in. Right. But you weren't but saying, oh, by t page 20. We, so many of us are no, kind of bullied into these formats. No, I never read those books. Formats and no, I never read the books. Yeah. I don't know the rules. So my daughter's a screenwriter now, and she's got all these books, and she's saying, no, Mom, by this page, you have mm -hmm. to, you know. <laughs> and That's really cute. And, you know. <laughs> I like that. You wrote your story. That's true on the final draft. Mm -hmm. And right. so we kind of did a test where we took one of my scripts, and I wasn't that off. I wasn't perfect, but yeah, I wasn't I mean, that off. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, honestly, if you will look, I mean, this is the shooting script, okay? So this is what she winnowed that down into. Mm -hmm. um, if you will look, and I was really enjoying doing this, actually. Like, I tried to point out at the beginning of the evening, on by pay, I think I pointed it out. I said, by page 20, we already have introduced everyone mm. we under we there's there's a lot we already have gracefully been helped to understand we've already had the meet cute where she is holding a knife to him and about to call the police or calling the police we've and we have on page 20 what i would call the thesis or i don't know what to call it but it's laid out for us what the movie is going to be exploring mm -hmm. what the problem is I mean, I read it out loud on for on purpose because that is page twenty. Right. That's not that. I mean, there's a lot set up. Be you know, there's a lot set up. You mm -hmm. know exactly who Harry is because it is it is literally explained to us at that dinner table. Right. But we already saw it. We know that they haven't had sex yet, but that they were about to have sex. We you know we know who Erica is because we get introduced to Erica by her sister, who explains to us just how successful and important. Important Eric is in the world, and yet she slip, sli sits home night after night after night. Why? Not because she has rabies, but because she's, you know, a, an older woman. So it's like that's what I was trying to convey. That you, you a lot know. of Marin's conversation with Harry in the car is about my mother. Right. Right. Or you wouldn't like my mother. 
Oh. And Can't Smoke in the House, my mother wouldn't like. Her mother's name keeps coming up a lot because, yeah. after all, it's a movie about the mother. I'm not going to write a scene between these two that has nothing to do with where I'm going. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of stuff that's right. in this draft. Other dialogue that I just get rid of. What's that got to do with anything? Mm -hmm. Get rid of it, get rid of it. You know, I think what I'm thinking of, just what was triggered for me with your question is, you know, I teach this class, you guys are all here, and I come here night after night after night hoping that... One night after night would have been... <laughs> Good, Nancy. You could have a long career. But I was just going to say that I keep hoping that somebody's going to tell me how. And that's what all this class is. How do you do it? What's your process? Tell me the secret so that I'll be able to do it. And one of the things that's so interesting to me is that Nancy Meyer does research. Look at all the things she does to get herself to figure out what the movie is and discover the movie. And she does this research. She doesn't know what's going to lead her down this path that's going to give her the answer. And she writes a 250-page script because she doesn't know what the script is. And, um, and the people who read those books, they are looking at those books because we're all just looking for something to hold on to. And uh, not that there's anything wrong with something to hold on to. I mean, no, I, I mean, think all of that, a lot of even that. Even if it's an illusion, you think of the actors, to whatever hold on to, right? I mean, well, no, it gave me great things. It gave me the Viagra joke. It gave me his tearful behavior, and it made me believe he could change. Without the heart attack, he was not going to fall in love with this woman. Had there been a flood and they couldn't get out, he was not, this was not going to happen. He had a life-altering thing happen to him, and he changed as a result of it. And Jack said to me, when we were shooting, he said, I think that he has the heart attack because he's met her. That's, how he, wow. that's what he oh, gave okay. himself for his performance. Well, that's one of the reasons there's such soulfulness in that performance, because it's that level, it's that depth. And I, I just want to add, I know there's other questions, but I just think that this is, um, you know, the, oh God, it just went out of my head what I wanted to say, but there's, I, I just am very inspired by you talking about research, because I know I've done that myself, and I think very, time, very often we just have to go out and have faith that some thing is going, in other words, we're in a certain state of mind, and you just have to do, you have to go looking and have faith that something, that something's going to hit you, and that has happened to me many, many times when technically, you know, I didn't, I, I just did it as an act of faith, you might say, you know, like the, th you know what I mean? Like you, it's not like you really know what your question is. At you don't know, but you know something's going to come out of it. Exactly. You know something will come out of it. You just wait. And that has happened to me many, many times. Um, okay, so let's take another question from this side of the room. Yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, Parent Trap was your first film, and I believe... Uh, first movie I first directed. First movie you directed. Right. And um, I was wondering how did you go from Parent Trap to What Women Want, which could have easily been helmed by a male director? How did you convince the studio think that... so? I think so. <gasps> I don't think so. Really? <laughs> I was just curious, though, how did you convince them that you could do it? How, how does a female approach? How did I convince them the studio on the Parent to, Trap? No, no, no. For what women? What women? Uh, they want. saw the Parent Trap and they liked it. Mm -hmm. You know, they thought it worked, mm -hmm. and they, they, you know, it, it was a popular movie, and uh, you know that it wasn't that hard at that point to get another job after that one because I had a movie mm -hmm. to show. Maybe the question is how did it get Parent Trap? That might be the question. I'd written and produced movies for 18 years before The Parent Trap. I didn't direct until I was 48 years old. So I had been a person who had made money for studios pretty consistently for a long time. And everybody knew that I was very much a part of the team that made these movies. I was always on the set. I was very hands-on. All the actors knew. You know, I was not... I was lucky. I was not an unknown person at 48 saying, hey, I'd like to direct a movie. I was a known person in the community and um, I've been around a long time I mean really mm. so it's different for you yeah mm -hmm. it's different for you and if, if I had wanted to direct at your age I would have had to have done it differently I would have made an, an indie film you know I would have found a way to get a little movie made so I could show that I could direct but I didn't want to direct at your age so 
What can I just ask? What what made you feel like you did want to direct, or is that an ob too obvious a question? Or no, no, I, I don't know if it's obvious, but. Um, writing and producing movies for 18 years it just I got I felt bored just producing and I wanted to you know it's like you were ready for that next yeah, challenge. it's like you want to be the passenger in the car always or do you want to get behind the wheel I right I wanted to get behind the wheel and my kids were getting older and so I felt I could I could do that but I didn't feel I could do it when they were little could we take that young woman in the back yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, I'm curious the difference, as you see it, between pitching to a room of men versus women. I'm curious if you pitched this movie to a room of men, women, or both. And then I'd also love to know if you're comfortable sharing what you would like to do now uh, or experience as a storyteller after all you have already done. I know that's a three-parter. <laughs> okay, it's a great question because the, the answer is just what you think it would be. I did pitch, pitch something, Scotty, of which followed what women want, so now I had a little something going in. Um, to a room full of powerful men with the woman in the room who was not the voice that was going to make any decisions, and she was sort of chuckling along, and the men, and actually the men were... Um, they were actually chuckling along as well, but I could see she was really relating to what I was saying more than they were. I thought the meeting went pretty well. I was surprised. By the time I got to my car, my cell phone rang, and it was my agent saying, they're passing. Oh. I said, really? I'm not even at my car. <laughs> How did this happen? He said, they just don't know if there's an audience for this movie. So I said, well, what women want was put in turnaround. After I wrote that movie, they, the, Disney put it in turnaround. They just didn't get it. They didn't see it. They didn't know how I was going to pull it off. They didn't get it at all. It just happens sometimes, you know. What, well, women, what women want. want ended up at Paramount, but I, I wrote it at Disney. Um, so then I went and pitched it to Sherry Lansing, I think. it. Did I pitch it to her? I think I did. Great great reaction. I think I pitched it to her. Am I confusing it with what women want? I can't remember. But anyway, then the other where I sold it was to Sony, to Amy Pascal, who was the person that could say yes. And she was just like right there. Her eyes were on me. She got it. She heard it. That's it. We're doing Love it. So it's a big difference, I think. Yeah. Men are not will I don't. I don't think men are really all that much willing to really take a gamble on a movie about in that case, you know, a woman in her mid fifties falling in love with her <laughs> daughter's boy. You know, they the, these people ha work for big corporations. They have so much money to spend per year. They need to get those franchises. They need to get those movies that are, you know, more sure things. And if they're going to gamble on something, I'm not sure that you know was going to be the movie they were going to gamble with. But, but Amy, it's also not their fantasy. Uh, no. <laughs> but doesn't it, you know, it's like it's they're not all fantasy. excited, like, finally, this is our chance to see Diane Keaton naked at, you know, whatever age right. she was when she did it, right. you know. But Amy n knew that women would like this movie or people would like this movie. So and you, doesn't it, it continually get proven, though, that there actually is an audience for this kind of story? I believe it does. When the movie works, yes. You know, I don't think any audience goes to any just anything, but you know. But I think if if it works, yeah, I do. But what was the last question? What do you want to do now? Yeah. Oh, I don't have an answer to that. I don't know. I'm not sure. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, hi. Um, I write and direct also, and for me, I. My question to you, which I'm sure you would answer similarly, not to put myself in your shoes quite yet, but the advantage is that when you're on set, you're saying, oh, that's not working. I'm going to write a little new line. But um, for me, because I'm not really. Like, I don't do that. If something's not working, I don't write a new line. I get oh, it to work. OK. <laughs> Um, I don't give up. Okay, well, my question though is, I mean, you have a very keen eye That's for interesting. Um, production design and everything like that, but visually telling the story, do you, I don't know, do you have any tips maybe? Because I do comedies as well, like kind of well, how I storyboard the whole movie. Okay. Every frame. 
is storyboarded. You do that with some, like a storyboard the artist? And the storyboard artist. Mm -hmm. Wow. Every frame. No wonder. That they do look so beautiful. How long, how long of a process is that? Months, four months. It's the longest thing. I start that even before I really have a green light. I start that because it's a very long process and I go through many drafts of storyboards. Ah. So that's a, you're a real I like to plan person. You're beyond. <laughs> I would like to be a little more like that. <laughs> I'm not You're doing fine. I I'm doing good, but I'm not. I'm not like that. I have a lot of fears about. But you know, I mean, <laughs> just the, the directors that I love, I'm sure, don't do that. That's just me. Yeah, that just works for me. So you and mean you mean blocked the whole thing, or mm -hmm. just when you storyboard it, you blocked the whole thing before you get there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, especially if you're working with like Jack or Alec or Steve or someone like that who's like a real comedian, if they kind of pull out this crazy thing and you're like, I like where you're going with that, like, do you allow it? Or Yes, yeah. sometimes if it's, um, well, let me think, they pull out a crazy thing. <laughs> well, my experience is, and I've worked with really big actors, is they like that, I think, they like that I have a plan. You're going to be here, you're going to come in here, blah, 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 then you know, and maybe you can. That doesn't mean if they say, um, yeah, okay, well, let me just try if I'm standing here and say, I mean, fine. I'm, it's not like you have to stand up on this line kind of thing, but it's, it is pre worked out. And I know I was talking to um, Jim Brooks about this once. He said, really? Before you get there? I said, but I've been there. What do you mean before I get there? How have I not been there? been there a million times. I'm on the set while it's being built. I'm acting. I get, take a video camera. We'll act stuff out. Well, you know, it isn't like just haphazardly chosen. I mean, it's, I think I've come up with the right way to do it. And do you rehearse a lot too before you get to set? No, I was talking about that before. My experience is that nobody's ever in town at the same time. Yeah. So I try to read through the script with all the actors, at least me and Meryl, me and Steve, you know, if I can't get them all in the same room. Oh, sorry. You and you were talk saying, about this and you were saying you grab your moments. You were saying you grab your interesting kind of private moments with a person rather than so much rehearse. Oh, like it. Like you were saying, oh, I might be they in the makeup trailer. They all show up for wardrobe. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> they always have time and will be at wardrobe, and they will come back and back and back. Right. Right. Because it's like and I, I work with a lot of girls. You know, yeah. Kate Winslet, Cameron. They all. Right. Everybody comes to wardrobe. That they will always have time for. <laughs> right. So I grab the moments there. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, you're trying on outfit after outfit, scene by scene. So they say, well, what do you, what do you see like she's wearing here? Do you think she's in a dress? Do you think she's in jeans? So, you know, and then I'd say, well, I, th I actually think she'd be in a dress because she knows he's coming over. And, blah, 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 and you know, and suddenly we're rehearsing. You're talking about yeah. stuff. And, and, but also I like it because there's, it's and they're they're casual, underwear. but you it's ca yeah. an advantage. You're dressed. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll go to you, and then there's a gentleman over there. We'll go to you next. Taking off from your visual, the visualization question, I took a course with Bruce Block, your producer. Yeah. And I just wondered if you use his vocabulary like deep, deep space and analog. No, okay. I don't. And I've no, but I know he's. This is Bruce Block, who's uh, been teaching at USC for 20 some years. And I've done all my movies with him except this last one. And he was the storyboard artist that okay. I worked with on er everything except this movie. Actually, because he didn't work on this film. So um, use him as a storyboard. Yeah. Artist. And my second question is. But not uh, just to draw, a right. real contributor. Um, you mine for co comedic effect, uh, like modern products such as cell phones and uh, laptops, and in your most recent film, the video uh, laptop with yeah. Alec Baldwin. I mean, do, do you go looking for those type of things, no. or just that they just come to you and just use them, or how yeah. does it go? No, I don't go. <laughs> Where would I look? <laughs> I go looking. <laughs> no, no, no. It just it it occurred to me, um, you know, doing this video chatting. You know, it occurred to me, what if somebody didn't know that you? Da, 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 and then <laughs> that is wonderful. Yeah, it's wonderful. Did you like Bruce's class? Yeah, yeah. yeah. everybody loves his class. Fantastic. Yeah, he is. Did you want? Did you have a question? Uh, yes. We're gonna go to this oh, okay. Time. And then you. Um, I just wanted to know if you had a question. <laughs> So I'm not gay, black, female, or over 40. To like my <laughs> <laughs> but I love your films, Thank you. and uh, and I get so much out of it because of the emotional connection, which you were saying before. And um, men actually do fall in love. Oh, 
<laughs> it's just awesome. We were watching the movie before. It's so great to see it again. Uh, my question, my first, I have two questions. The first question is, how long is the shooting script? How many pages is it? I don't know. Oh, it's um, it's a very it, oh, it's it's well, it, it says 130, but I just want you to understand that the last page is like this tiny. So mm -hmm. it actually is technically like a 120, 129, 129. let's say, but. Okay. It's, it's really longer because I use the tight, not the very tight, but the yeah. tight. Oh, yeah. I, mean, uh. I don't. But she also writes a lot of stage direction. You know, again, you'll look at. There's a lot of stage direction. You can look at script. some scripts. You go down in the library, and, and like, you know, Nancy was saying, there's a lot of white space. And some people just like to underwrite like that. And she's got a lot of description. The good thing about that, you know, this isn't the good thing. This is just a thing that a lot of people don't read the stage directions, like like probably um, the actors, probably half the actors and executives. But it's such a good way to communicate with so many people before you have to communicate with them because everybody who's reading this is getting such a precise. Also, everything is not in dialogue. You know, he yeah. looks, she sees. You know, I mean, how do you? You gotta get those moments, you know. I, I totally agree. That's kind of how I write too, um, how we write. Uh, the other question was, um, uh, how did you start becoming a writer? How did I start writing? Yeah, when did you start writing? Um, you were baking. <laughs> you were baking, right? Well, I was working on a game show, really, and um, which game show? The Price Is Right, yeah. in the very early '70s, and. Um, like writing questions or? I was the PA on the show. I would come up with those prize packages, you know, <laughs> and I would come well up with done. things that tied things together and oh, nice. tried to always give them a little feminist slant. I remember at one of our <laughs> big meetings, you know, this little kid, me, raises her hand and I said, I don't really think women want washing machines. Really. <laughs> it's like everybody turned and looked like, what is that? That person? is so great. It's <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, so you were a PA. Yes, um, and I started to actually attend some things like this, and I would, I was just knew I was, I knew from the day I got that job this was not the right job, but I had just landed in town, and frankly I needed to support myself, and that was fine, um, but I immediately started to do things like this and listen to people talk and I just got more and more into it and interested and I w and I what I thought I wanted to do was uh, initially write TV and um, on the game show that we did they owned another show called Password and the host of Password was a guy named Alan Ludden. Alan Ludden was married to Betty White and Betty and they would sometimes send me over to be a PA on that show and I um, I met Betty and she was adorable. She was so nice and so I admitted to her that I really wanted to write for Mary Tyler Moore. That would be my dream to write the Mary Tyler Moore show, which right. of course she was on. And she said, well, honey, if you ever have anything, you know, I'll show it to them. So I was, you know, without telling many people working on, some, so anyway, I got that going really fast before I never saw her again. <laughs> And I gave it to her, and she took it to the show. She actually kept her word. And I got a phone call from the story editor of the show. We really like your script. Do you want to come in? And I just couldn't believe it. It was like a girl getting a phone call in a movie, you know, like, you know, like, just so thrilled. So I went over there, and they thought I showed promise, and they said, you can observe at our show. We would like you just to observe how we do it. And I quit my job. But the... The invitation was only for a week, which I didn't realize. <laughs> <laughs> I could observe for a week. Yeah, but when you quit your job, the universe knew you were serious, and yeah. so things started happening. Yeah, exactly. So that's how it sort of started. So you, that's how you know Jim Brooks from? Never met him. You didn't meet him then? No, I never met him. You didn't meet him then? No. Oh, you were just I met Alan. I oh. never actually, I was only there a week. I never met Jim. Oh, that's so funny. It is funny. Did you meet Mary Kay then? Is that how no. you know Mary Kay? No. Okay. How did I meet? No, I met Mary Kay through Charles. So what's about the baking? And you? Well, then I had to make money. Yeah. I now didn't You'd have. You'd quit a your job. I had quit my job. <laughs> so I come from a long line of excellent bakers in my family. We have some great recipes. So I did some baking and I sold them to restaurants. And so I would 
bake all day and I'd write at night and and that was an anything story exhaust uh, it was pretty exhausting and you know because I was really doing these two jobs and really not making enough money because cakes I wouldn't really sell them for a lot and they co like cost seven dollars I sell them for twelve it was like crazy <laughs> so <laughs> I um so I, I got a job I needed a job and so I went I, and I and I was very lucky I got a job as a story editor for, for a small movie company and then from there I became a story editor for a big movie company and then I was like in the movie business and TV never I never really had thoughts of TV again but you were you writing that whole time well, I was uh, I, during the baking I was during that period I was working on these Mary Tyler Moore episodes but I never got one through. But I really enjoyed doing it. I really liked writing it. Well, and they served their purpose. Yes, I mean, they did. you learned a lot, probably. I did. I did. I did. How many did you write? I don't know. Maybe two. Maybe two. But you were you were learning something. Yeah, I was. And then, um, but when I became a story editor, which is not a job anymore, they called a CE you now, creative executive. I would. Is that like a development? Person? Yes, I was the head yes. of development for a really big movie producer named Ray Stark and I would read a gazillion scripts for him and it, with every every time I'd end one I'd be like I can do this <laughs> you know every time I'd get to the end I'd say I can do this and um, Wow. So Early on, I got a job as a reader for the Paul Kohner Agency, if you remember yeah. that. And I would read these scripts, I would read scripts, and my job was to do coverage. And the same thing, I mean, I was like, I know I can write better than this. This doesn't even make sense. I, I knew I could at least make sense. What was great about this job was that it was my job to work with the writers that he, um, that we had writing, that he had writing scripts for him. They would actually come in I w all day. Like there would just be meetings all day long where we'd pitch and work out their structure and everything. And invariably, these writers would say to me, "You're, you know, you're good. You should do this." <laughs> I said, they, I, they, "They knew." They were very nice about it. They were right. very nice about it. And and uh, I said, "I want to. I did. Is what I want to do." Blah, 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 you know. Anyway, so then I left there, and within a year, I'd say I wrote Private Benjamin. About a year after I left Stark. So and you co-wrote that. I wrote with that with. Well, I like to think I wrote it myself. But <laughs> no, well, no. It, maybe that's it feels it like you totally wrote it. Totally kidding. I never say that. I wrote it with uh, <laughs> Charles Shire and Harvey Miller. Right. It was a blast writing that movie. I, I knew um, Harvey. No, Harvey? I, I was at his funeral. Didn't you speak at it? I mean, I that, that thing at the, at the you. Falcon. I, but, just, um, I Harvey, represented all the women, didn't I? Well, Har at some point, I don't know if you remember this, this guy Harvey Miller was a bona fide character, and his masseuse came up at some point, and she's talking about how she met Harvey Miller, and she said, how many women are here because Harvey hit on you? And like half the women in the audience raised their hands. There was so much in Private Benjamin, I mean, not to go on and on, but I have to say, I guess I'll, I mean, I'll always remember first seeing Private Benjamin because it kind of blew my mind. There's always things that when you see them in a movie and you haven't seen them before, like there was something about the way she was a Jewish girl. It, yes, it was, a f it was sending up a Jewish girl, but it was also making her, giving her hu her real self, her real humanity. Like for me as a Jewish girl, I really had not seen that in the movies except maybe once. I, I, I don't know. I guess the way we she were. Is, Goldie is Jewish. so uh, was There was something about it that just was Goldie. so special for me. And <laughs> that moment when she's dancing with Armand de Sant and and he says, I'm Jewish, and she, the, the cut, the cut too is now they're f fucking, I mean, it's like, you know, because she's like, I don't think we could really, you know, because I don't, you know, what, I, I forget what the setup is, but it's like she's backing off, and then he says, I hardly know, I think she's saying, like, I hardly know you're telling me about yourself, because I'm this and this and this, none of it means anything. None of it means anything, and then, and he, then he goes, and, and then the oh. cut too is they're in bed. I remember how shocking the line so was. Um, when uh, it was Albert Brooks, right? Yes. Her, her ah. husband, and the husband dies, and the parents were like, "What were his last words?" And <laughs> she says, "I'm coming." <laughs> 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 that was pretty shocking, but that was great. a pretty good line, Nancy. A great time writing that. Oh, what a great movie! Um, okay, right, right here. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay, it's all right. I have to say, I'm a huge fan, and thank you for telling your wonderful stories. They're just wonderful, and they're heart touching, and I'm just. Love them all. Um, 
My question to you is, in your career yes. of writing and directing, has there ever been a moment when the studio's execs, or as I call them, the suits, <laughs> they come and they say, hey, we want this scene changed, or and it's, and it's a scene that is just, it's a pivotal scene, and you don't want to change it, or you don't want to rearrange it in any form or fashion. I can't think of that ever happening. That's no. never happened. Okay, because I hear stories. Shooting and they come to you, well, or you're about to shoot or you're shooting. Or even in the story when they're reading the script and they want it changed, modified in any way. Has there, has there ever been a moment like that for you? Um, and if so, how have you handled that? Can't think of one recently. I mean, I, actually in Private Benjamin they had some notes, as I recall. Uh, but we had notes too, you know. That was an example of the first draft wasn't good enough when we handed it in. We, we, the first draft took us four months to write. The third act, we just rewrote the third act, and that took six months, just in the third act. I don't know why. You know, I just read today on the internet that Private Benjamin's being remade with Anna Ferris. Is she still Jewish? <laughs> Private Benjamin, who knows? Very odd to have something that you're so associated with be, be remade and never a phone call is I don't know anything right. about it. It's not. I don't know a thing about it. So. Right. That's really bizarre. That's bizarre. Are, I, I said that this young woman could go next. Keep feeling I'm Hi, I just wanted to ask you if prior to your script editing and eventual writing of the Private Benjamin screenplay, like growing up, going through school, whatever, did you feel yourself to be a strong writer or that you wanted to be a writer or storyteller? Was this something that happened once you got out to LA that eventually that came into your mind? I thought, um, you know, I don't know the answer to this. I've talked to my mom about this and some of my childhood friends. They say I, w I was funny. And um, and I guess I, th you know, if you are funny, you know, you, you you enjoy seeing people laugh at you and getting that reaction from people, you know. But I don't think I ever thought I'm going to be a writer. I don't. I can't explain. I don't know. I don't Did know. you like to write as a kid? Or? Yes, I always liked writing. I was a writing major in school, but I never thought screenwriting. I never took a screenwriting class. I thought I'd be in advertising or something. I didn't sort of put it all together. And do you mind if I ask? Um, Not at all. <laughs> did, did you feel that confident when you were writing your first screenplays? Or would yes. you say that I've even now sometimes confident. you... I'm always confident. It's a weird curse, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I do feel confident. And I wrote with somebody who always saw the glass half empty, you know, so it was always, no, it's going to be great. No, it's going to get made. No, they're going to like, you know, it's just, I don't know where that comes from. And I don't even know how true it is, but I... It's my thing. It's, it's, it's how you're put together. It's, it just comes naturally to you to think that way. It's character flaw. Um, I, let, let's take one question from this side. I feel like... Okay, but then we're going to go over here. Yeah. Um, the new books, not Sid Field, but the new books say that you should know your poster and your, your title, your film title, even before you write. Is something's got to give the original title of the film and at what point? movie was called the untitled Nancy Myers project all the way through the mi it's a good catchy title <laughs> <laughs> it was also the name of it's complicated um, <laughs> so I'm not great with titles but where what women want I had that title the day I started writing mm. which is I thought a really good movie title <laughs> well so is it's complicated yeah it's complicated but where what what about which something's got to give I mean no it exactly. sucks Oh, it's great. But I mean, it doesn't suck. It's just not, it's hard. Well, here, I noticed today when I pulled this out, title ideas. Oh, do title you know, ideas. The, 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 um, Here's it's some? complicated. Do you know, like, on Facebook, when you're in a relationship? No, I'd never been on Facebook <laughs> at the time. But I had the title of It's Complicated while I was writing. And then I actually forgot about it. And the movie became untitled and in project again. And then... Everybody, they hire companies. That, and I went through this on something I'd give. They hire all these companies. People come up with titles. As a matter of fact, today I've, uh, I almost brought it. I, I saw Jack's list of titles. All the actors gave me titles. I want to <laughs> see your list of titles. I want to hear your list of titles, well, of possible titles. None of these are good. Okay. The, the, I don't even know what some of them mean. <laughs> One's called Love Life. Baby, it's you. Generic, awful. Kiss and tell, terrible. The escape artist, meaningless. <laughs> the Ice Age, which I liked. Oh. But then there was a an animated yeah, movie an animated Ice Age. Um, men for each other, awful. 
<laughs> love with a tw I mean, these are horrendous. Mood swings. <laughs> They don't mean, mean Something's anything. Something's Gotta Give was the right one. So we had no title for Something's Gotta Give. They cut a trailer together, put the song, When an Irresistible Force Such as right, you know, right. Something's Gotta Give. I'm watching the trailer and I said, oh, what about that? And everybody was so worn out at that point, they said, <laughs> okay. <laughs> And a week later, it was playing everywhere with that as the title. And then it was like, I said, I don't even like it. They said, it's too late. The trailer's out. <laughs> and everybody, everybody always says to me, I really like As Good As It Gets. And I said, me too. <laughs> oh, they really do? Oh, my God. That's so funny. Oh. That's so funny. they said something wrong. And then they're like, <laughs> They would have remembered mood swings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really good way to get men to come to the theater. Yeah, really. <laughs> right. If you don't, if you if you loved him at home, you'll really, you'll really go for them at the theater. <laughs> My husband's like, no, that's okay. I just spent the whole day with one. I don't need I don't need a, mo a mood swing at night. Um, Carol. Um, uh, Hi, Nancy. Thanks oh, so much for coming out. Um, I, want, I love Something's Gotta Give, um, and I also loved It's Complicated. Uh, yeah. Just That really struck a chord with me, I guess, being a child of divorce. And I was really, I laughed my butt off, um, but I also was really touched a lot um, in a lot of different places. Um, and one thing that I really loved about it was the John Krasinski character. Um, and of course, the casting was just, he was so good in that role, but I think the role was just so exceptional. Um, and I and I thought a lot about it, and I thought it, it it's almost as if he's a stand-in for the audience a little bit, because he's yeah, not a member of the know, family, the but one that knows, yeah. he loves them, he loves the whole family, but he's, he's not really technically a member, and he's privy to what's going on when the kids aren't and I just um, was wondering if you saw him at all as a stand-in for the audience and if you could talk a little bit about that supporting role it's supporting but I think it's so important to telling the story he's definitely the comic relief I mean because the, the, there's so few people in that movie that anytime I was really surprised how much the audience liked him that was the big surprise at the preview how he scored every time I cut to him that I <laughs> after the preview, cut to him more, because <laughs> they, he I'm sure he so liked well. that. Yeah, he loved it. Oh, I, te I texted him after the first preview. I said, you will not believe how they respond to you in this movie, because we didn't really, we thought, you know, we, we liked what we were doing, but it, it seemed to have a bigger response than I had anticipated. Do you think his performance brought something more to the character than was I on the page? I think it did, yeah. It was also his idea. He came to me, and he said, and I'm not that open a person, so this okay. was risky, you know, because I had already worked with him. He was, had a little part in the holiday. Okay. Mm. But he came to me. It's not that I'm not open. I like it the way it is, <laughs> you know, basically. Because I spent so long, you know, and I don't think somebody thinking of making their part better is necessarily going to be what's good for the movie, you know? Right. But anyway, he came to me and he said, what would you think if Meryl finds out that I know? Because I, that I didn't have. I had, he sees it, but he never tells her anything. I thought it was a really good idea, yeah. you know? So I said, I actually really like that. Let, let me work. And then that was the only thing I really changed in that movie. So I added that scene out in the courtyard where, what do you know, blah, blah, blah. And he says, I say, oops, I come down, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. And um, I think there's one other beat where they know. But I thought that was a really good idea of his. And it, it added something. And it, I, it gave I, them something. And then, it, then that also gave them a final little moment together. In the movie. I, I love how he sort of engages in their zaniness, like when they're smoking the joint in the bathroom at the party. <laughs> yeah. And like, he's like, oh, no, no, no. I, and then he's like, oh, okay, I will. And then yeah. somebody gives him a shotgun or something like yeah. that. It was very, very fun. Well, Alec improvised that. Yeah, well, at that the was end brilliant. of every take, and that, I don't know if you've seen that, but at the, at the end of every take, um, somebody did something insane. Yeah. <laughs> they were all really fun. <laughs> And that was actually in the gag reel. That shotgun thing was in the gag reel. And I had forgotten about it. And I saw the gag reel. I said, well, we must put this in the that, movie. That's so old school. I don't know if people still give each other shotguns. <laughs> anyway. I the way they reacted, I think they all knew what it was. <laughs> I love that character. Angel? Oh, can we go over here? Oh, are you? Oh, sorry. I was just wondering if you write in order, or do you get 
like if there's a particular scene that comes to you on a day and like you really just start going on that and it might oh, be in I do the it middle totally of the week. In order. So you do it totally in order. All I would through. go crazy if I, that's so not <laughs> how I could possibly think. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I would allow myself to have an idea that wasn't what I was doing the next day. No, that's not true. If I had something, I'll make a note, but I won't go there. You won't go there yet. You'll just make a note. No, and I got to get, get up when it to comes. It. Okay. Because I write. You know, like in a way that something is laid in and then pays off later and then it's mentioned again later, you know. Okay. It's like checkers. I'm rigid, as you can oh. tell. You, you're a planner. You like to plan. Oh, d um, okay. You're organized. And you're not a people pleaser. That's and you're confident. Really no, I really admire that. An understatement. <laughs> I, admi I admire that. That's um. No, I am. Th I I would say I try in my own way. I think you're very interesting. Okay. <laughs> Winnie's a fan. Well, yeah, I am. I mean, it's a series of things that I'm not. So you know, who wouldn't be? <laughs> Hi. Um, now that we know that you do things in order, I did have a question in mind about. Getting mired in details sometimes, you know, when you're you're trying to get through a script and you're writing it, and do, do, you, do you have little tricks that you do to get out of the, the details, the forest for the trees kind of thing? And um, do you focus, take it to the plot, or, because I have these issues, so I'm asking you if you have. I'm not sure if, if I have this issue, so I'm trying to try to relate to it. Like, what do you mean? Give me an example. Um, let's say you, you're in a scene and you're writing a scene and it, it takes you to a place that you weren't expecting and you want to get it right and, and something stops you, some, something blocks you and you don't, it's like you can't move forward because you, it's not right yet. And, yeah, um, I'll write it bad. I'll write it badly. Yeah, and you know. just go m and then move forward from there. Well, not happily. <laughs> oh yeah, see that's you the know, hard part. So I'll, you know, I could, I don't write a scene a day. I could be on it for days. You mm -hmm. know, I could be on it for days. But I will take a stab at it if I think there's an idea there, and I don't exactly know how to articulate it or who should say it or how it's going to come up. Two hundred fifty pages. So there's you scenes. Just go, yeah. I just write it long. I'll write it. I'll just write it though. So the, you find that the, then the editing would be the, where you. Yeah, where and you then end I'll look up. at it the next day and I'll toss it out and I'll try another way. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not a scene a day. It doesn't go that way. It's yeah. Well, because you're not going to really know what you need at that stage, right? I mean, in other words... Well, once I've done the outline, I kind of know what I need. But in the outline, I'm just exploring. I'll write down any thought I have. Like, will you write down images, not... Let's find out. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, when you say any thought, like, I'm, I'm wondering, like... Pieces of dot... Yeah, piece of dialogue. Piece okay. of dialogue. Julian says you're very sexy. No, I'm not. That ended up in the movie. I was yeah. just quoting that tonight on no, the phone I'm call not. with you, yeah. saying that that's like. But that's she's trying to talk him out of it. You know, he makes a comment so and she's great. like, yeah, "It's no, so great." It's so great. She not. goes, "No, I'm not." <laughs> I mean, no, that's just a thing. I didn't know where to put it. Or that's so awesome, though. I mean. It, it just can't, you weren't in a He scene. notices, uh, Harry notices things about her, notices things she does around the house or... Um, That's in the movie. Things, things she's afraid of or asks. It's just being observant. That's yeah. just a random note. Right. Why did you ask? I don't know why I'm doing this. What did you ask me? Well, we're saying, like, what kind of random things will end up in the outline? Like... Music choices. Is it stuff to get to feel like getting you in the mood? Like, what's this stuff? Just the feeling. Erica of has to think about what this has done to her. Falling in love. Is she nicer? Is she more accessible? Has it changed her work? She set up a life. How did she let him in? She's surprised. She feels out of sync. Maybe she's never been in love before. Maybe she feels giddy. That's everything of the movie. That's there it was. Who knew I had it back on page 38? You did it. <laughs> it's, it's also a good reminder that sometimes your early instincts, you know, sometimes you forget about your early instincts and you get away from them. And then, you know, the good thing about a document like this is, oh, no, it, this was a good idea. And sometimes you should go back to your first idea. Before I forget, I just want to talk about all of the things that she sets up that are interesting in and of themselves. They don't feel like set up. But when, they, when you see them later in the movie, they make you feel so emotional. Um, or know what's going on, the stairs, all the, the recurring stairs. Um, 
and the him not being able to get up the stairs and then he can get up the stairs and then he he uses that as a euphemism to talk to to Keanu, as I like to call him, and then later when he comes back and he's in his house and he, he sort of chooses to not go up those stairs. Um, and, uh, I never thought of that. That's true. Yeah. He, oh, really? Interesting. Well, he, because I thought, oh, that's so interesting is that he's, it just felt like a moment and the, and the stones and the glasses Glasses. and Paris and, um, La Vie en Rose and, um, Damn, I Good can't. Good accent on that. Merci. <laughs> I th- as I was saying that, I thought that sounds so pretentious. <laughs> but no, I do know how to say La Vie en Rose. But, um, and, and wait, that other song, um, the, you guys know. The, the other r- French song? No, oh, no, the no. Louis the Louis Armstrong? Ro- the, the romantic song, yeah. The Louis Armstrong? No. Oh, that is La Vie en Rose. What's the other no. song? Somebody help me. Oh. It had to be, yes, thank you. No, it wasn't it had to be you. I've got, I only have lies for you, thank you. Yes, but the, the, you know, just the meaning of it and the emotion of it, so by the time the farther into the movie she gets, the more you, she's... T- We're all a part of it at that point, you know. <laughs> How about those doors? Ben Howell, oh, I know, that... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was oh, gorgeous. Yeah. Um, one last question. <laughs> Did you have a question? Dude. Good, yay, Pamela. <laughs> um, before Pamela asks, I want to thank Pamela and Victoria and Sandy. They're here every yeah. night and they're invaluable and everybody else who's out there. But Pamela has never asked a question. Have you asked her a question before? Well, Nancy's, I mean, she knows this is it, my idol. But here's my question. Thank you. Um, we talked about, you know, your beautiful sets and, you know, the elaborate houses and the details and how you look at that as another character. So I, my question is, what is the largest budget that you've had to work with and what area as a director do you spend the most money in? You're like, I have to have this right. I spend the most money on days, shooting days. Yeah, I like to spend money on people, mm-hmm. editor, production designer, cinematographer, actors. <laughs> um, and what's your largest budget? It, it, ballpark. Like, the studios love you, so <laughs> kind of what are they we trusting you with? You're a female. Yeah, we don't talk about money. Okay. No worries. But, you know. Right, we have to have one last question. <laughs> I don't want to end the night on money. Uh, yeah. That's okay. But you know, they're big budget. Oh, sure. Probably. Oh, yeah. You. Yes, lady in the front. Can you elaborate more on your actual pitching process? The pitching process? Yeah, when you pitch it. Because you said you only had it to a certain point. Well, that's that, that movie. I've never, there's certain things in this movie I'd never done before. Like I never wrote a 250 page draft before. Mm-hmm. I never only pitched up to, I don't know what was going on with me, but that's what I did. Um, when I pitched It's Complicated, uh, I went in with everything worked out, completely worked out, and I told them the whole story, and I took 45 minutes to do it, and I... Wow. That's insane. That's I a don't long recommend time. that. No, really, don't do that. <laughs> that's too long. That is really too long. But um, different movies, you know, happen in different ways. But having been a person in my youth who heard pitches, I can tell you they're bored out of their minds. They know right away whether they like it or not. I've given this advice before, like when they ask you if you want coffee, say no. They don't want you moving in. They don't want you there. You know what I mean? They just <laughs> they don't want, want you moving in. <laughs> you know what I mean? Don't don't answer the coffee. Whenever in, uh, someone would come into my office and my assistant would say, "Would you want coffee?" If they said yes, I was like, "Hey, they're going to be here till the end of the cup." You know? <laughs> they, you, you know, their time's valuable. Go quickly. If it's a comedy, you know, be funny, and um, give them ideas of who could be in it. Uh, how do you see it? Where do you think it could shoot? Um, they'd love to hear it, wouldn't be really expensive. I know I wrote it into the, but you could shoot it into, you know, they want practical things like that. And um, be efficient in the way you tell it. Now I know I said I took 45 minutes, but I had you're, them. You're, you're you. <laughs> and, and also, she's also earned the right to yeah, you yeah. do things you how she needs to do them at the time. Minutes, but it was at least 30. It was long. 
It was really long. I like how you had said earlier in the evening about how you take the audience by the hand and you, because we, I was talking about your sort of graceful, not sort of, but very graceful way of expositing things in a short amount of time. And you, and I, I've always felt like that's what I have to do. Uh, of, sir, of course, when I write, but I mean when I pitch, I feel that you have to lead someone through your story in a way where they'll, where where it won't be hard for them at all. It's like you have to take them and help them, help them see your story in the, in the way that's the most the most fun for them and not at all work for them. In other words, they don't have to struggle pay to you, pay attention. You can tell if they're tuning out. I remember when I was being pitched to. They couldn't tell. <laughs> they couldn't tell from my face. You know, you can read people. You can. You're a writer. You're observant. You know, if you can see you're going into two, you may be charmed by that part, but they got it. Move on. Get to the next. You know, what I mean, don't tune out. Don't don't think you were prepared to do it like this. This, these many steps. Therefore, you must tune into what's going on in the room. When I pitch Baby Boom to somebody, he fell asleep during the pitch. <laughs> It was remarkable. <laughs> it was hilarious. No, it was, what did I do? I just was dying laughing inside. I mean, I thought it was hilarious. I take it he didn't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, you know, that anecdote that you told at the very beginning, or it wasn't an anecdote, but the inkling of the idea when you had dinner and the guy, the women kept getting younger, uh, that's the kind of thing that I would begin a pitch with because then pe everybody can relate to it and they start seeing it. Is that ever s anything that you would? No, I probably wouldn't have told the real life thing to it, but um, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. Yeah, get them to relate, get them, in, hook them. You know, Billy Wilder said when you're writing a movie, grab them by the lapels and don't let go. <laughs> Same thing in the pitch. It, it, the reason I say that is because sometimes a personal story, because I've been there too, and I glaze over and there's people here in the room who are currently working for me, and I'll just go, no, I don't want to hear that. Um, I usually try and be nicer than that, but... Um, but you know, you, 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 when somebody tells you a personal story, you, you almost do get more interested. Um, but she's right, you do, you, you want to tune in to what's going on. Uh, you know, they're yawning, they're holding their yawn. You see the slip to the, the I mean, just watch. But even just the glazing over, it's you know, apparent. it's apparent. And then I just want to get, I just want to get out of there yeah. as quickly as possible. Um, this is a horrible segue um, <laughs> to wanting to get out of here as quickly as possible. But this has been, this has been amazing. such a, a, a pleasure and an honor. Nancy Meyer. Thank you. Good luck, everybody.